example, uh, you know, smart, uh, smart mirrors. So we put electronics there. These, all these wearables, all these smart tags, you know, like we put electronics everywhere. And that's the problem because if we take a look to the rate where these traditional electronics, so what I said, so the cell phones, uh, um, just computers, TV screens, you know, like the normal, let's say electronics, if we see the rate the semiconductor industry produces chips, it was increasing and increasing and increasing, okay, steadily. And my, my point is that at this point here, where we are now, that we are putting all these smart stuff, okay, so we are wearables, internet of things, you know, like this is smart tags, wearable, I mean, smart patches and all these things. So this slope is going to increase even further. So if we have now a problem with electronic waste, wait 10 years from now, it's going to be a real, real big, big problem. And so, okay, so how paper is related to all of this? There, there are already early works in where they were studying like the effect that they will have in the environment just as, you know, changing the conventional PCB boards, the backlight uh, PCB boards by replacing them with a paper-based backlight, a paper-based uh, PCB board. And they were founding already that the same circuit produced with a conventional standard fiber ba uh, fiberglass-based PCB board and a paper-based uh, PCB board, the, P the paper-based one contaminates 100 times less the environment. Okay, so this is already a huge change. And we are just talking here about just the fiberglass PCB board. Okay, so we are not talking about like replacing the silicon, okay? Another important aspect of these paper, like, uh, paper substrates for electronics is the cost. Okay, so while paper is like 0.1 euro per meter square, silicon wafers are 1,000 euros per meter square. And we consider in electronics, silicon is a very cheap, uh, you know, like a, like substrate. And, and paper is 10 times, uh, 10,000 times cheaper. Okay, this is important because some of the applications to come, like all these uh, internet of things and so on, they will rely heavily on the cost, okay? Now, what is important is if we combine this biodegradable aspect of paper with the ultra low cost, then we open up possibilities to new applications where conventional electronics cannot be used because of cost or because of the damage to the environment, like disposable electronics, okay? So those kind of electronics applications in where we just want to use our, our device and throw it away. Okay, for example, this example will be a point of care application where you measure something of health of a patient. And then once you finish, you just throw it away. So you avoid cross-contamination patient to patient, okay, which is a very important thing when you're talking about like heavily contagious uh, illnesses and so on. Or it could be also important for all this, uh, this emerging field of a smart tax. Okay, so put in information into the tags that you attach to your to your products could be information about just the product itself about the trackability of the you know like the places the product has been stored and the conditions the, the product has been stored this can be very important for example not just for these products of the supermarket but could be extremely important for things like uh, for example uh, tracking tracking the conditions where uh, human organs are being stored during the transit from one hospital to another one, right? Okay, and, and also these directly smart patches, no? So electronic components that use uh, attached to the, to the body to monitor the, you know, like human physiology for a certain amount of time and after that, you just remove them, throw, throw them away. What paper is never going to do, and this is the spoiler alert of the talk, okay? So, we don't get confused. I don't oversell stuff. You know, I don't tell you that paper is going to replace silicon and so on. Paper is never going to be used in very complex integrated circuits because paper is heterogeneous. Paper as a substrate is not as nice as silicon. It's very difficult to fabricate a device that works, you know, like in such a large scale, like every single components, they are fine. It's very difficult to miniaturized in paper because of these heterogeneous components of the, of the paper base. The paper is based on fibers and these fibers, they have 10 microns diameter. So then scaling down 
lower than 10 times this fiber diameter, it's challenging, okay? So paper is never going to be used for microprocessors or any other kind of like integrated circuits, basically. But there are many applications even nowadays, right? Where we use silicon as a, just a dummy piece of semiconducting material. For example, there are temperature sensors in which silicon is just a piece of semiconducting material with a thermally dependent resistance or photodetectors, you know, in where we just use uh, silicon as a dummy piece of, of, of semiconducting material in where we make a, you know, a Schottky, a Schottky contact in order to make a photodiode or some gas sensors, you know, their silicon is just a substrate in where we fabricate our complex oxide gas sensing on top, nothing else. There are other sensors in where we can easily replace not the silicon, but we could replace the, the PCB board very easily, okay? Fine, so these kind of applications are the ones in where we can use paper electronics because in this kind of applications, we don't need integration or scalability. Sorry, I went. But so now the, the second part of the talk is integrating these van der Waals materials, these layered materials. Okay, so these van der Waals materials, you know, it's um, there are this family of materials that they have a strong bonds in plane that they form layers and they stack on top of each other just by van der Waals forces. So you can easily peel off these layers. You can cleave these crystals, okay? So these are the crystals that we use to cleave and get single layers, you know, like these two-dimensional materials by mechanical exfoliation, for example. So now why are we interested in integrating these van der Waals materials on paper? Well, integrating electronic materials on paper is difficult because of the surface of paper. It looks like this under the SEM, okay? So we cannot use the techniques that we have in semiconductor you know, silicon semiconductor industry, you know, to put silicon on top of the of paper, for example. So we have to find something new because this is not flat, this is wettable, this is porous, this is a mess. Okay. So what people have done so far is using all the techniques that we have uh, developed humankind for drawing, painting, printing, right? In order to fabricate electronic devices on paper with inks. And so th there was a revolution when inks of organic semiconducting materials appeared. So it's possible to make these inks with organic semiconductors. Some of them, they are heavily doped and they can act as a, as a, as a, as a contacts. Uh, it's also possible to make silver loaded inks and so on. And you can use these inks to do a, a sort of uh, printing technologies. Okay, so it could be inkjet printing, flexographic printing. I mean, uh, all the screen. Uh, screen printing so you can use all these uh, printing techniques that we have developed for papers books uh, journals etc to do electronic devices and people have used these organic semiconductors so now the question is is why because they have low performance and they tend to degrade upon environmental exposure okay so these uh, organic semiconducting materials they are not very stable and the mobilities and so on they are much lower than than inorganic silicon the reason why people use this is because they have ability to fabricate the inks. And secondly, because these organic semiconducting materials, they are very flexible, okay? And this is important because paper bends all the time. I mean, it's, it's not a, a sturdy substrate. Changes volume when changes temperature and humidity. So then you need to put an electronic material on top that can sustain certain degree of deformation. So if you place, a thin slab of silicon on paper is going to crack. So it's not going to be or delaminate and fall apart, right? So it's not going to be useful for paper electronics. Now, this is the point where comes uh, these uh, van der Waals materials because they are as highly performing and as stable as other inorganic semiconducting materials and they are very flexible. They are super resilient to mechanical deformation. Two-dimensional materials and van der Waals materials they can they can stand the formations up to the to the breaking point of uh, let's say one ninth of the young modulus, which is very very close to the fundamental limit of, of a brittle material. So it means that these materials they can sustain very large deformations without breaking, which makes them uh, highly desirable for this application of paper electronics. 
up to now, so like the way people have fabricated these uh, semiconducting materials on paper with, with two-dimensional materials, with Van der Waals materials, is basically copycat the process people have used in organic semiconductors. With organic semiconducting materials, remember that I told you people were fabricating these inks. And then what people did with Van der Waals materials is taking powder of these Van der Waals materials, putting a solvent and using sonication in order to cleave the crystals by cavitation forces and making kind of a colloidal suspension. Okay, and this colloidal suspension can be then inked, printed on the paper substrate. But the problem is, it's very challenging to make homogeneous films because you have this nature of platelets floating on a solvent. When the solvent dries out, you get this coffee stain problem. Okay, coffee stain or coffee ring stain problem. So it's not very easy. So you have to use typically very expensive printers in where you can tune all the parameters of the printing. And moreover, typically in order to get homogeneous films, you need to use non-standard papers. These non-standard papers, they are not low cost. They, they are almost as expensive as silicon wafers. So the low cost, uh, you know, like a, like a selling point of paper is no longer is no longer a thing. And moreover, these specialized papers, they typically have a, a surface treatment on the, on the, on the surface that um, is, is basically a plastic, you know, to control the porosity of the paper, to reduce the porosity and the wettability. So then these, these non-standard papers, they are not as biodegradable as conventional, let's say, office paper that we use in our daily basis. Okay, so then the biodegradability, the biodegradability selling point of paper is also no longer um, doesn't doesn't stand uh, anymore with with these kind of, of processes. So next problem that we, we face when we fabricate these devices by printing is that as we have this colloidal suspension of platelets floating on a solvent that we use this droplet printing kind of process. So our films, they, when they get dry, they get trapped of these solvent molecules in between the platelets. And those solvent molecules trapped in between the platelets, they typically uh, hamper the electrical transport through the film. Okay, so like the electrical performance of these kind of films, they are uh, degraded seriously by the presence of these molecules trapped in the interfaces. An alternative to this wet process will be to use a printing process that is completely dry. And we are all familiar with this printing process, right? So we can transfer Van der Waals materials on paper just by eroding the Van der Waals materials against the rough surface of paper by abrading the Van der Waals materials. Okay, so that is exactly the process that we do with our pen, pencil, sorry, with our pencil on the surface of paper. We apply a friction between the surface of the paper and the graphite of the pencil, and then we leave a trace of interconnected little platelets of graphite. So basically, when you take a look to the to the SEM uh, pencil uh, pencil trace, you see these platelets of graphite, like like uh, you know, like forming a compact film on the surface of paper. So this is a very well method to fabricate a compact film in a dry way. Okay, so here the contact between the platelets is very intimate, so you don't have any of these uh, molecules trapped in between. So now the so this has been used in order to fabricate sensors and other electronic devices on paper, uh, but mostly just using pencil on paper, okay? So, and all this field started around like 2013 and there are like a, like a bunch of paper, not too many, so, but a bunch of them. So usually like some kind of uh, electrochemical sensors. Uh, so there are also like gas sensors, uh, I think like field effect transistors as well and also like strain gauge sensors, basically. Fabricated with just drawing uh, on a piece of paper with your pencil. Okay, so when, when we were under lockdown in, in Madrid in 2020, so I, I tried, I, I, I needed to try, right? So, I mean, I, I was reading all these papers and I said, okay, I mean, I'm going to try my, my devices at home, you know, and the only thing that you need is a sharpener, a pencil with a high constant, uh, uh, content of, of graphite. So it has to be a soft uh, pencil, B type, and then some kind of paper and scissors. And here I printed out with my printer the outline of the device in order to make my life easy because I'm not a good drawer. And the, 
sample and device fabrication is as simple as this, okay? So this is a little bit speed up as you can see, but I mean, it's, it's relatively fast and, and simple, right? And there we go, my strain sensor fabricated on paper. So I have to, I, I needed to try if, if this is in read, indeed working and, and you can see that indeed it works. So it increases the resistance when you apply tensile strain. When you apply compressive strain, it decreases resistance. And you can even use it as a temperature sensor. So if you just glue one of these uh, meanders on a, on a coffee mag and you pour some boiling water, you can see how the resistance of this graphite interconnected network starts to decrease because graphite is, a, is let's say, a zero gap semiconducting material. So you get thermally activated transport when you, when you increase the temperature. All right. So now the question is, all this has been done with graphite, pencil, more exactly. So, but what about other layer materials, okay? And when I checked through the literature, it was almost nothing, okay? It's always something. So there were one paper in where they fabricated some photodetectors by mixing graphite with another semiconducting layer, semiconducting material in 2015. And right at the same time, we were writing our manuscript. So there was this group from, from Exeter, from Freddy Vitters, that they were doing exactly the same process, but on plastic substrates instead of on paper. Okay, so, but also the abrasion induced deposition. So, um, yeah, I mean, science. So we, we end up finishing our manuscript and so on anyways. So let's, let's talk about like introducing other semiconducting materials on paper. So not just graphite, that is kind of like, an, it's almost a metal, let's say, but we are interested on in integrating other materials in order to fabricate more uh, sensors, okay? So because graphite is not good for many sensors, for example, photodetectors, okay? So then the way we do it is exactly the same thing. Instead of using a pencil, so we need to use another kind of pencil in where our lead is made of a van der Waals material that is different from graphite. You can do that exactly just by rubbing uh, an, a single crystal Sorry, my pointer is my pointer is kind of like crazy. Okay, so you can you can do it by rubbing a single crystal of, for example, molybdenite. That is molybdenum disulfide. It's a semiconductor material with a band gap in the visible range, but you can just rub it against paper. Uh, alter, alternative to that, you can purchase powder of Van der Waals material. For example, it's it's really uh, readily available in Sigma Aldrich, Alpha Isar, all these chemistry companies. You can buy many of these layered compounds in powder form, and you can just put the powder and rub it with a cotton swab, for example. And that also creates a good homogeneous film on the surface. So basically it's similar to the graphite, what I've showed you in the, in the graphite SEM. So this is molybdenum disulfide. And when we rub this molybdenum disulfide single crystal against the surface of the graphite, you see against the surface of the paper, you see the paper fibers and how these molybdenum disulfide flakes they kind of like cover all the surface and they even fill all the gaps in between the fibers, okay? Usually in, in, in paper, in bare paper, you have these fibers crossing and you have big trenches in between them. And these trenches, they get filled very effectively with the flakes of these Van der Waals materials, okay? And then creates a very homogeneous film. I say that it's a very homogeneous coverage because there is, so this is the edge of the uncoated paper. And you can see that in the SEM under this, uh, illumination conditions, it becomes very dark. And this is the cover with molybdenum disulfide. So basically the big change in the contrast allows us to tell whether the coverage is relatively good or is patchy, okay? And we see that it's very good actually. So we have only few patches, few small patches where the coverage is, the coverage is not good. And then you see the paper underneath. Okay, so far just told you how we, transfer these materials onto paper, but what can we do with that? Okay, so we have done plenty of devices because the fabrication is so simple that you can fabricate many devices with different materials and, and explore different things. And I'm going to give you um, a handful of, of applications that we have developed in the, in the past year uh, using this semiconducting material. The first one will be the semiconducting molybdenum disulfide on paper in order to fabricate a photodetector. And this has been done with Ricardo Frisenda and Ali Masahiri, that they, they were uh, the, the, the guys involved in, in this project. And basically in this case, we 
transfer this molybdenum disulfide by rubbing, as I, I said, a single crystal of molybdenum disulfide. You see here the film of molybdenum disulfide after the process. And then we can put electrodes to it just by drawing with a sharp pencil of graphite. And then we fabricate these interdigitated electrodes. This kind of device can be um, you know, measured with a normal source meter unit in the dark, and then we can illuminate the whole area of the device and we can measure again, okay? And if we do this process, like for example, we start with the off light, then we turn on and we measure the current as a function of time, and then we switch the light off and we measure as a function of time. So then we can measure both the photocurrent and the response time of the devices. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, the, the, the fears of many of these photodetectors, they're not really good. I mean, the responsivity is in the order of one microamp per watt. Right now, we have increased this dramatically by changing materials and changing processing. So right now, we are about to finish a manuscript and where we get 100 milliamps per watt. So basically, like orders of magnitude larger responsivity. But, uh, but this, is, this is quite modest so far but it's good enough to search for certain applications. And I want to show you here an application in where we use the, these, these paper-based photodetectors as a single pixel camera, okay? And you can see that basically what we are doing is we have an object, we scan it, okay? And we have this single pixel making kind of like a scan, okay? So like a, like a standard, uh, you know, desktop scanner. And this is the, the picture of the object taken with a standard cell phone camera. And this is the picture of the object that we get with our paper-based single pixel photo detector. Okay, and you can see that there are some imperfections in the object that we can, we can clearly see in this single pixel camera that we fabricated with the photo detector. So it's still good enough for many applications, I would say. Another easy application for these paper-based devices will be to use them as a, as a temperature sensor. So in this case, we fabricated another set of samples similar to the previous ones with molydisulfide, but this time with tungsten disulfide, interdigitated graphite electrodes. And then we measured the changes in the resistance of these devices as a function of the temperature. And we saw that the, the change is huge. Okay, so it's a semiconducting material. So basically when you increase the temperature, you populate the conduction band with thermally activated char carriers, and then you decrease the resistance dramatically, okay? So, so it's a, it's a semi-exponential, it's an almost exponential tra trace here. So it means that it's very, very sensitive around room temperature, okay? So much more than other materials. I mean, graphite is especially sensitive to temperature ch changes and tungsten disulfide is way more sensitive than graphite. These devices are so sensitive that one can use them to monitor the changes in temperature when we, breathe close to the sensor, okay? We, we fabricated the sensor, we cap it with, with a plastic in order to avoid changes in humidity on the sensor. And then we measured the changes in the temperature when we exhale and inhale air during the breathing. So it can be used as a breathing monitor as well. So this already gave us some, some idea about like, okay, so why not to use it actually as a gas sensor? Because, you know, it's so full of, of uh, patches of, of semiconducting materials that most likely has a huge contact area with the gases, okay? So then our colleague, uh, Daniel Matatagi, that is in, right now in the Autonoma University of Madrid, so helped us to, to make some measurements uh, for a sensitivity to nitrogen dioxide. It's a, it's a gas that is, is very yeah, interesting to monitor because it's, it's harmful for humankind and it's, it's been found in, in engine combustion and combustion engines and so on. So, so you, you want to monitor it in order to be sure that you have a clean air and so on. And so what we found is that our, our devices, they were very sensitive. You see here, sub pico, uh, sub uh, part per million uh, resolution, and they were quite selective. If we, if we put it in contact with other gases that they typically interfere with nitrogen dioxide, so like ammonia or carbon dioxide, you can see that the responses to start with is opposite in sign and much, much smaller, much smaller in, in magnitude. Okay, so, so these, these sensors are very, very promising, let's say, uh, if we compare it with the state of the art, that the state of the art requires 
sensors that they are operate at high temperature. These, temper these devices, they work at room temperature, so we don't have to increase the temperature and so on. So I think this is the last application I wanted to show you. So we were working on using these devices as well as a, as a strain gauge, okay? So as a, temp as, a, as a strain sensor, okay? And basically we fabricated these kind of like films Okay, so we have a tungsten disulfide film contacted by graphite electrodes that is also quite flexible. And then we were monitoring these current versus voltage traces as a function of the strain we apply with a three point bending test. From these measurements, we can extract the change in resistance as a function of a strain, and we can estimate the, the gauge factor across uh, clo clo uh, close to the zero strain. Okay, so basically the slope of this, of this uh, you know, trace here. When we compare several devices made with tungsten disulfide with several devices made with graphite, but they are these ones here, we can already see that the tungsten disulfide has a much higher gauge factor than the graphite devices. Okay, so this is already telling us that, uh, that this uh, using a semiconducting material for the gauge factor, the gauge, uh, the, gauge uh, the strain gauge, is going to increase our gauge factor dramatically with respect to, to graphite. So once you have a good gauge, uh, strain gauge, you can use it to sense forces, okay? And the first thing that we tried, it was just making a kind of a cantilever with paper, putting our strain gauge here at the base of the cantilever, and then loading the cantilever with masses, okay? And then basically we were monitoring the resistance of our device as a function of the change of the mass loading that we had. So basically we were making uh, a disposable balance, okay, a small balance with sub milligram resolution here. Okay, so not bad, okay. Okay, I'm coming to the end of the talk. So what will be next? Okay, so I want to finish just by, by pointing out that this is not all done. I mean, we have been working on this a lot in the last year. So we have plenty of results and it might look as, okay, I mean, there is no point on in jumping into this field, but it, it, is not, it is not true. I mean, basically you can, you can see that you can take basically any Van der Waals compound and you can transfer it to paper surface and you can make good films out of it that they are conducting or continuous, let's say. So it could be any kind of material. So from, let's say this low, bank up semiconducting materials all the way to hexagonal boron nitride is is uh, is an insulating material it could be even superconducting material like niobium diselenide magnetic materials so you can i mean any physical property you can think of you can find it in a van der waals materials family and then you can integrate in paper you know to fabricate your your paper based or paper supported sensors okay and I think that's it. I mean, I, I will have to acknowledge the funding from the Agencia Española de la de Investigación and the, the government of Spain, FESIC, the European Research Council, and also the King's South University through the Distinguished Scientist Fellowship Program that they support a part of this research that I have shown today. And with that, thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Andres. So uh, it's now open for questions, uh, audience. Sir, one is in the Q and A. Yes, okay. sir. One question is in uh, sir. Uh, one question is from uh, Dr. Arul. So, how to control the thickness of dependent sensitivity in such pencil or pen-based fabrication? Hello, Dr. Andrew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was reading yeah, the question. Uh, I... Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so basically, the, the thickness of the film, it is controlled by the by the diameter of the fibers containing the paper. Okay. So the, the standard copy paper has fibers that they are like ten to twenty micrometer in diameter, and basically you can get films that they are of the order of of ten to twenty micrometers in in thickness. Okay, now the thickness of the flakes forming this network of interconnected flakes it cannot be easily controlled with this abrasion induced deposition. So that is true. Then there is, a, there is an intrinsic variation from sensor to sensor, but that is uh, 
I would say, is not as important the thickness of the containing flakes and so on, but just the nature of the films. So, so these films, they're they are just flakes touching each other. So basically the physics that explains the transport through these films is percolation theory. And if, if you take a look to like, if you make your math with percolation theory, you, if you have a percolative system, you cannot expect to fabricate two of them and being exactly the same. So there is a, a, there is a distribution of resistances on these films just because they are percolative. And that is something you have to live with. So of course, this means that you cannot fabricate highly performance devices with, with these paper-based electronics. I mean, you cannot fabricate a sensor that is the state of the art in sensitivity because you are going to have this variability from sensor to sensor. But you have to think of applications where it is more important the ability of using it and throwing it away than actually the sensitivity, reliability, and so on. So some applications in where it's yes or no. So has my organ been exposed to light? Yes or no, right? So more than has been exposed to exactly 10 microwatts. No. So if, if you want an application in where you want something precise, uh, most likely this paper-based electronics is not going to be the way. But not just the abrasion induced. Any printing technique is going to have the same problem. Uh, there is another question. How is uh, thermal stability of a paper sensor? Oh. It, it is like, <laughs> what is the thermal stability of paper sensor. So you can you can warm up a paper up to 150 degrees without uh, burning it. So that's okay. So and and we have fabricated these uh, these temperature sensors that they operate all the way up to 110 degrees if I remember correctly. So so I mean you can you can cycle the temperature of these sensors. Moreover, we have fabricated some cryogenic sensors on paper, and we have cooled down all the way to 150 millikelvin, and then going back to room temperature, and the devices, they were still alive, okay? So like paper doesn't degrade in all this process. Now, the thing is that paper changes volume when you change temperature. So like the, 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 the performance of the device will change with that, okay? So it's not just the sensing film for example, tungsten disulfide resistant changes with temperature, but it's not just that. I mean, also, like if you put some other material that doesn't change with temperature, you have to expect a little change because of the change in volume with paper upon temperature change. Uh, there is another question also. Yes, How much should we? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, continue. Uh, there is... Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, how much should be GSM of the paper and what is the range of paper temperature sensor? Um, I don't know what is uh, GSM. Thickness, thickness, essentially. Thickness okay. of the paper. So, yeah, so like the standard copy paper, it's 100 micron approximately. So like they're like depending on the manufacturer. So like there are differences 90 to 110 microns in, in thickness and the our temperature sensors we we tested them from room temperature to 110 degrees if i remember correctly that was the maximum we tested in the lab uh, but we have checked that our devices they can survive to liquid uh, liquid uh, helium so i mean it could be i mean we could try doing doing an even larger range actually i don't see the like the point on, on using a paper for temperature sensor in a cryostat, but anyway, so just for fun. So any more questions? Professor Andrews. Yeah, uh, Professor Andrews, uh, it was an excellent uh, talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, when we look at the uh, tungsten disulfide versus uh, graphene, I think, you said the, uh, the WS2 has much more effective gauge, uh, gauge factor, as well as I think in the sensing of NO2 also, you said that WS2 has much better sensing than uh, graphite, or graphene or graphite. So what is the reason for it? Any idea? Like, Yeah, 
For the for the temperature, I think it's uh, it's clear because of the semiconducting nature of tungsten disulfide. So graphite is a semiconductor, but it's uh, is almost a metal. Okay, so then then all these thermally activated char, char carriers improve the resistance. I mean, improve the conductivity of the channel, but the dark current of the of the device is very large already. So that is clear for the temperature sensing. No? So for the strain sensitivity is not that clear. What is the difference? It's not that clear. Uh, Professor, actually it is a excellent work and I wish that uh, you will succeed in your attempt uh, to replace the PCBs at one point <laughs> of time. Uh, coming up, uh, actually, uh, you talked about various materials that can be uh, done in this simple methodology, but uh, if you want to come out, if even the simplest devices that you had shown where uh, the silicon can be is actually a redundant material and you can throw it and you can use alternate materials, uh, even to uh, reach that kind of a device level, how far do you think you are? Mm, still really far, I would say. So we should we should develop. I mean, right now all this abrasion induced deposition we are doing, let's say, manually, right? So we are working in order to do some kind of like like computer numerical control version of it in order to make it more automated. But it's still far away from that. But uh, but I foresee other other routes to that. So um, right now we are doing this just the uh, abrasion. But there are other dry methods in order to deposit Van der Waals materials on, on surfaces. So, so vacuum deposition methods, for example, evaporation, physical vapor transfer, the sputtering. I think those are the solutions to go. So if, if we start uh, using this kind of, in for example, those processes, sputtering. Can, in, those, in those processes, can we really use paper as a substrate? Yes, there is no problem. So okay, as as good. long as you as as long as you don't warm up uh, higher than 150 degrees, it's okay. So in in thermal evaporation, you can easily get that. So and and there are there are even like uh, like examples in the literature. So like the earlier uh, thin film uh, transistors. So they were fabricated on paper, actually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Andres, could you comment on the uh, lifetime of these uh, paper drawn devices? Mm, yes, um, much longer than one would expect. I mean, because with, with as we say, it's biodegradable, so it, it will, you know, like disintegrate in time, but it's much longer than one would expect. I mean, we have pieces of paper at home, right? So they don't self-destroy in, in one year. Okay, so for example, our gas sensor, we measure it right after fabrication and we measure it after half a year. And it was still detecting nitrogen dioxide with almost the same performance, of course. I mean, it changes a little bit. So, but, but it, it, was, it was, let's say, within like what, what one would expect from these kind of like dirty devices, okay? That's excellent, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for wonderful talk. If anybody has a question, so please contact our, uh, Dr. Andres uh, via mail. And uh, uh, it's a, a, a lot of insights uh, we learned from this talk, like uh, uh, paper-based, it's very exciting. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Andres uh, for his uh, wonderful talk. So thank you very much. So, thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna now, yeah. Professor, get well soon. So, yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sir, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sumit Walia. And uh, Dr. Sumit Walia is a professor at the School of Engineering, RMIT University, Australia. In his research, focus on micro and nano electronics as well as specialized sensors such as gas, radiation, pressure, and bio. And he has published more than 130 articles in international journals. And recently, he was awarded uh, the 40 most influential uh, Asian Australian award in the science and medicine category in 2021 by the ANU Center of Asian Australian Leadership. He received various fellowship 3M Eureka Prize for Emerging Leader in Science and Australian Academy of Science EMCS Fellowship 
the royal society of victoria philip law uh, post doctor award uh, for physical sciences uh, net explo unesco top 100 innovations of 2016 for nano memory innovation and many more and he is the chief editor of two books and he is a reviewer uh, for over 30 international journals including nature communication advanced materials and acs nano and nano scale and he is a member of the project governance board of the victorian government's international education short term recovery uh, plan and he is an expert assessor for the netherland body of scientific research and the germany of research foundation and the uh, australian uh, research council now i would like to uh, invite uh, uh, dr uh, sumit walia uh, to deliver his talk doc uh, th thank you for the invite and the kind introduction uh, could you please confirm if you are able to see my slides yeah 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 okay um so first of all i'd like to thank the organizers for the invite and all the attendees who are in uh, attendance today a uh, good day everyone i realize we probably sitting in different time zones so that's why uh, it's better to be more generic um so uh, as mentioned in the intro um, i'm sumit walia i'm a professor in engineering at rmit university which is in melbourne i co-lead the functional materials and microsystems research group um we are a team of just over 40 people um focusing on quite a few different aspects of research and also uh, its translation in partnership with industry so i'm going to touch on a few uh, things as i go through the presentation so before we go into the technical details uh, just for um some of you who may not know our mighty that well uh, so we are located in uh, the central business district of the city of melbourne um we our mighty was founded as the royal men's college in 1887 and was established at a, as a university in 1992 so just a little bit of history and some fast facts about um about our mighty um which i have i've listed here this is just a photo of the the campus that we have in the city but we have campuses across melbourne which focus on different um uh, and uh, aspects of um, of rmit's uh, education uh, portfolio we also have overseas campuses uh, for example in uh, vietnam we have a presence in europe through rmit barcelona as well so we we we, we are basically uh, a multinational uh, university if you if you can call it that way um just a quick word about the facilities so most of our work is um, conducted at what's called the micro nano research facility so it's an umbrella central facility at rmit uh, which houses a comprehensive set of uh, fabrication design modeling packaging uh, facilities for micro nano scale devices and it also works in conjunction with um the um, advanced manufacturing precinct so we have capability at the micro nano scale but then to translate it into you know uh, uh, the millimeter centimeter and meter scale is where we talk about the manufacturing precinct so the micro nano research facility houses nine core laboratories and um, has most of the uh, fabrication and the uh, characterization equipment that 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 we use and as i said it's a central facility um, all researchers across the university and their collaborators are welcome to use so now going a little bit into our specific area of work uh, i've kind of put down some bullet point lists of what we work on i'm not going to read them one by one at the moment for for the uh, sake of time but essentially you will see that our work is mainly focused on the synthesis of materials and then looking at multiple different applications across different sectors um so probably this flow chart would depict what i'm trying to say a bit better so we focus uh, one of the parts of our work focuses on um, the and unit cell thick materials which are you know uh, one at one single atom thick or a few atoms thick materials um, based on what we are trying to achieve and what sort of applications we are looking at uh, we synthesize these using you know three different um, 
uh, broad uh, synthesis techniques, solid phase, mainly this is to look at fundamental properties and the fundamental physics of materials. And this involves, you know, things such as mechanical exfoliation, which by the way is a Nobel prize winning method uh, from close to 20 years back. Um, but but that's that's more to understand the materials, its behavior, its physics, its light matter interactions at a fundamental level. However, when we talk of scaling up and producing large area systems and devices, uh, we also synthesize materials in the liquid phase and the vapor phase um, using things such as you know, um, chemical vapor deposition, for instance. Um, the core application areas, if we divide them by categories, we mainly uh, focus is on electronics and optoelectronics, um, where we look at you know, utilizing 2D materials for field effect transistors, uh, memory devices, photo detectors, LEDs, and light-driven artificial neural networks. We're using these to mimic uh, brain function. Um, but besides that, we also focus quite a bit uh, on you know, uh, flexible devices. So having these materials integrated into um, uh, elastomeric platforms, um, looking at the effects of strain, using strain as a tuning tool, um, and a very different uh, application uh, in antipathogenic coating. So here we collaborate with people from biochemistry and microbiology to look at uh, ways where we can have these 2D materials um, interact with harmful bacteria and virus as well as fungal particles and see if we can actually eliminate them. Um, and the last one is uh, more mechanical in nature where we're looking at chromic composites, uh, integrating again these materials as additives um, into different sort of epoxy resins, um, uh, pertinent into things such as materials that are coated in the aerospace industry for fault detection. Um, we also have works where we again use these additives into uh, engine oils to reduce the friction coefficients and make them more efficient. And that, that's in partnership with a few organizations based in India, which I'll touch on as I go um, further into the presentation. So um, given uh, Andres uh, presented a little bit of an introduction on 2D materials, um, I won't go into too much detail um, of what 2D materials actually are, um, but just, just as a quick layman language terms, um, as the name suggests, they basically you you uh, cleave layers off um, uh, atomically one by one and reach a single or a few atoms thick um, uh, uh, configuration. Um, as the name suggests, so two D materials, the carriers are trapped in two dimensions, so they are constrained in two dimensions. They don't have a third dimension, and that gives rise to what is termed as quantum confinement properties. And these are quite different from um, the properties that they have in bulk. Um, the most classic material again in this family is graphene, um, obviously studied for a lot of applications, um, but our focus is on materials other than graphene. So we, we've uh, looked quite a bit into phosphorine. We've actually synthesized some new material systems uh, uh, based on the demand for application. So I'll start talking a little bit about our work in phosphorine. This is uh, one of our um, oldest ongoing works where we started on this material about eight years back. Um, black phosphorus obviously has a layered crystal structure like most 2D materials do. Uh, it has a thickness dependent natural direct band gap that includes, increases with reducing thickness. So you can use thickness again as a means to modify or tune its properties. It's, it, it's highly flexible uh, and, and has been investigated for a broad range of uh, applications as of now. However, when it was first identified, um, there were a few issues which I will go into. Uh, shortly. So our, our work with phosphorine is mainly based on mechanically exfoliated uh, layers that, that, that we transfer onto the substrate uh, that we need to and, and study it at a more fundamental level. So when we started working with this material you know, about eight years ago, uh, there was an immediate problem which the research community had identified. And the problem was that yes, phosphorine had really good properties, 
for electronics, optical, optoelectronics, optics, energy storage, and you name it. However, a fundamental issue was its ambient stability. So basically, I, the material uh, could not be stable in the ambient environment for too long. Um, so initial reports that emerged during that time, and I'm talking 2014, 15, suggested that humidity was the cause of degradation of this material. We actually embarked on a journey to try and understand the origins of this degradation because what we found from our work is that it actually wasn't humidity that was the cause. Um, it was photooxidation. So light was the core cause um, of, of this material degrading. Uh, the presence of humidity basically just acted as a catalyst. So, so it made the process faster. So what we identified and reported in these papers that I've listed below is that it, it, it's photooxidation, it's light that, that causes um, this, this degradation. Um, more specifically, we identified that the light actually interacts with the oxygen in the environment to create what are called reactive oxygen species um, on the surface of black phosphorus, which then react with the uh, phosphorus, create these phosphoric acid, acid species and completely uh, mechanically uh, degrades the material within, within a few days. So we, we basically did a controlled test and these, these are just um, images of Raman maps that we acquired for some uh, specific black phosphorus exfoliated flakes in the presence of humidity and light and then controlled humidity, no light or with light and no humidity. It was very clear that in the presence of both light and humidity, uh, the, the reaction of deterioration was, was much faster. Um, however, when there was no humidity and no light, um, the, the the flakes remained intact. Um, when there was just humidity, but no light, largely intact, and which, which kind of told us that you know, the presence of light is an important factor um, that, that causes this degradation. In fact, we showed that if we operate phosphorine-based humidity sensors in a dark environment, they can operate as a really good humidity sensor for, for a long time. Um, so that kind of established the origins or the mechanism of why this material degrades um, over time. So once we um, ascertained that light is the core cause of degradation, the next natural question we asked ourselves is, what wavelength of light actually causes the maximum damage? Um, and um, just one of the many experiments we did is you know, taking FM images as shown here, different time points, uh, with respect to illumination with different wavelengths of light. Um, and what we saw is that mainly the UV spectrum was the core contributor to this degradation. As you can see here, within two hours when you shine UV, just UV on it, um, the material is completely deteriorated. Blue, to a certain extent, starts the onset of the degradation, but short bursts of blue light were okay. It, wa it wasn't you know, as aggressive as the UV. And beyond that, when we look at the visible and infrared, we hardly saw any deterioration. Um, so with this study, which, which we reported in this paper on the bottom, um, we basically then narrowed down the wavelength of light that was causing the maximum damage. So we understood the material, its properties, and its interactions a little bit more. We, we, we looked into why UV is causing this uh, maximum uh, damage. Um, so we related it to a few different things. So one, we found that the material absorbed strongly in the UV, um, which, um, which um, contributes to that um, phenomena. The other thing is we, we got some help from our collaborators in our chemistry department to prepare chemical assays, monitor the production of um, uh, reactive oxygen species such as you know, hydroxyl radicals or singlet oxygen species, which are known to cause maximum damage. And we did see that the production of this species was significantly higher um, in, in the presence of UV light and blue light, whereas it was not much or negligible in other wavelengths, which kind of is back to what we saw with the AFM images. So, why I told that story is that, you know, that, that story really helped us zone down on the mechanism of why this material degrades. 
uh, zone down and narrow down on the wavelength of light that causes the maximum degradation. So then we started looking into obviously how we can prevent this from happening. Um, so if we could you know, stop the production of the reactive oxygen species or come up with a way that they cannot damage the surface, uh, that we thought would be quite powerful. And again, uh, we came up with a very simplistic approach here. We, we chose an ionic liquid, fluorine terminated ionic liquid, which basically sits on the surface of black phosphorus. Uh, it does not prevent the formation of reactive oxygen species, but it sequesters these species as they are formed. So when black phosphorus reacts with light, these species are formed, but this layer starts sequestering these species. Um, at the time, and even now, there are plenty of other techniques to actually protect the black phosphorus. The most common being just passivated with some coating like aluminum oxide. It works very well for things such as field effect transistors. However, it also puts a constraint on the functionality of the material in that, um, for instance, um, it would prove a detriment when you're using it for any optical or optoelectronic application because the aluminum oxide coating itself would block uh, a lot of um, you know, wavelengths of light. So that's why we wanted to come up with the approach that retains the maximum uh, functionality of the material while solving the problem. So this work was published in Advanced Materials um, and we were successfully able to show, you know, through fabrication of um, field effect transistors as well, when we compared untreated steam black phosphorus to our ionic liquid treated black phosphorus field effect transistor, uh, there was a massive difference in stability. So anything untreated decayed within a week. Uh, however, surface treated black phosphorus was stable even after 92 days, which is which is just over uh, three months. Um, so so that, that, that was... Uh, Quite, quite good in terms of creating uh, this stability in the material because that then allowed us to explore it confidently for you know, new applications. So one of the core applications uh, areas which you know, naturally leads in from, from our uh, previous studies that I just outlined, we started looking at neuromorphics and particularly artificial vision. Now, this is a figure that's, that's from one of the review papers in literature. It does talk about a lot of challenges that need to be addressed to um, truly get neuromorphic hardware and also artificial vision. So I'm, I'm just showing this as uh, kind of creative setting the scene for what I'm trying to show next. So we specifically in our work focused on trying to mimic how a human vision system uh, can be emulated using using hardware, using devices. Um, so that this is just a schematic diagram of uh, a comparison between what a human vision system is and how artificial vision uh, can really uh, revolutionize um, the, the, the industry 4.0 applications. So one of the core things of an artificial vision system, and when we talk about the human eye, um, we need to really, really also think about the human brain because eye is basically a light capturing device in, in, in some ways, um, similar to what photo detectors are in a, in, a, in a hardware equivalent. But the really important part happens in the cerebral cortex, right? So in the brain, we obviously have these neural uh, connections. You have billions of neurons um, connected through synapses. Um, now, synapses work through uh, excitatory or inhibitory potential that's outlined here. So if we can actually create a device that can mimic the behavior of neurons, we could then build around that capability to try and realize artificial vision devices. So for us, at a very fundamental level, um, we wanted to mimic synaptic excitatory and inhibitory potential um, in our devices simply using light. So um, in, in some slides, I've also named the person who's mainly led that work in my team. So in this case, you know, Dr. Taimur Ahmed, who was, a, who was a postdoc fellow in our team, uh, led this work. Um, so what we did here is a simple terminal device. Uh, the, the intriguing thing we found was that black phosphorus has a natural tendency of harboring defects. And these defects could be used as trap states uh, to trap charges. So when you shine different wavelengths of light, you, uh, we were able to actually generate different 
um, parity of photocurrent. Now, that, that could be trivial in a way, but when, when you look at mimicking excitatory and inhibitory potential, that became very, very powerful uh, because the natural physics of the material would tend to increase the current when you shine light because of the photogenerated carriers. Um, so here we use the UV range um, to look at whether we can generate excitatory and inhibitory potential um, with black phosphorus. And this phenomenon of getting a reverse polarity actually allowed us to then start mimicking uh, things such as learning and forgetting. So we basically, uh, if you think about these two, you're in, in very general terms, you can think about the, the more training cycles you have, the better retention of memory you will have. So that, that's just normal uh, brain operation as well. The more you, you know, rehearse or learn about something, it goes into longer term memory and you forget it at a much slower pace. Um, one of the core needs in memory systems when we're talking about hardware is the ability to reset. So this opposite polarity response helps us to reset, erase just using pulses of light rather than, you know, uh, high voltages in terms of a third terminal. Um, and then uh, the device operation becomes really energy inefficient. So if you want to look at more details here, um, I, there's a paper I've listed, um, which you can go to. Um, we also connected up some devices in series and showed some very basic logic operations that we were able to do um, just, just by shining uh, light on, on these devices. Um, and more recently, we have now started looking into integrating the devices with artificial neural networks. So at the end of the day, when you talk about artificial vision, um, you want the capability of capturing uh, the image, uh, storing and processing it on the chip itself rather than the standalone components, uh, which create a lot of integration issues and, and, uh, and energy and really high energy requirements besides, um, you know, uh, crosstalk, uh, data latency, delays, etc. So there, there are a lot of problems with having standalone components. So integrating very simple neural networks, we were able to show that the devices um, here, the data from the devices was fed into the neural network. We were able to train the device to recognize numbers and images and different kinds of patterns. Um, obviously, there's a lot more work required here to uh, make this neural network more robust. Uh, probably should be now moving towards using convolutional neural networks that can self-adapt based on the operation of the device and compensate for any memory decays that can naturally happen in electronic devices. So that leads me to the next kind of devices that we work on. So here, just previously, I talked about two terminal devices in a planar form. Uh, we also create you know, vertically stacked memories where we have, uh, in this case, for instance, uh, two-dimensional molybdenum trioxide sandwiched between metal layers in a classic physical configuration and use electric fields to basically uh, modulate the movement of oxygen vacancies and create these distinctive uh, resistance states um, in, in, in the memory element. Uh, the same platform we also showed can be a very um, effective high-speed um, UV detector. Um, and the main reason is that MO3 uh, can be uh, constrained to absorb in a very, very specific uh, wavelength in the UV band. Um, talking about photo detectors in general, uh, we, we work on quite a few different material systems for broadband photo detection. Uh, one of, again, the recent ones that we've worked on um, is um, tin sulfide. Um, it has a very um, high light absorption coefficient, um, tunable band gap, um, and we synthesized it using um, a more recent process of uh, liquid metal printing. So uh, basically having a molten tin in a sulfurized environment and peeling a top layer off. So we used tin sulfide that was uh, under two nanometers thick, um, and we were able to show that uh, it was uh, a very fast um, photo detector for wavelengths ranging from UV to the near infrared. Um, a related area that we work on also is um, 
trying to develop heterostructures, understanding different types of band alignment, engineering different band alignments based on applications. So one of the uh, recent collaborations with uh, the NPL um, in New Delhi has been creating these 2D, 3D hybrids where we have MB grown gallium nitride, which is, which is a high band gap material interfaced with molybdenum uh, disulfide. And we show that we can actually uh, broaden the spectral response uh, from, from this heterostructure uh, by engineering a type two band alignment uh, between uh, these. So again, there's a, uh, I've listed uh, the relevant applications down the bottom. Um, more than welcome to go through them. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, so, as I said, there are quite a broad range of materials we work on. I probably I shouldn't go through each and every of uh, these at this point, but we we have the ability to create these overlapping heterojunctions, um, such as PN junctions. Um, there's another material, antimonine, which we have started looking into recently, sulfide that I just touched upon, indium sulfide, and also phase change materials such as the sulfide selenides and tellurides of antimony. So these are just a photo of recent uh, fills of these materials that we have uh, fabricated, um, and we'll be, we are currently investigating their phase change properties. Um, as I said, we synthesize most of the materials in liquid phase um, two and also using CVD, and it all comes down to what application we are targeting. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, you know, we also look at integrating these materials into elastomeric platforms. So a lot of the devices that are presented previously, we've also translated the same device architectures onto um, different kinds of um, flexible and stretchable platforms. This, for example, is an image of a black phosphorus ripple a flake on, on a PDMS surface. So that then allows us to try and understand fundamental influences of strain on its electrical and optical properties. Um, this project down the bottom where you look at changing inks, so these are basically UV chromic inks. Um, it's a project that, that came about in partnership with um, industry, uh, Carl Zayas specifically. Um, and here we first created these color changing inks using dimensional molybdenum trioxide. Um, then integrated them into elastomers that could change color when exposed to UV. So the idea was essentially to have UV patch that you could put on your skin. And when you have had your threshold of UV exposure, which means that any UV exposure beyond that would be harmful for your skin, you'll see a change in color. Um, and that's basically time for you to get out of the sun or apply sunscreen. Um, so we customized the inks, customized its concentrations based on six different skin types because the color of the skin also determines what your customized or personalized threshold of exposure uh, to UV would be beyond which it will start becoming harmful. Uh, so here's just another uh, snapshot of a collaboration uh, which was led by the Indian Institute of Petroleum in Dehradun, where we basically looked at um, 2D materials as additives into engine oils to reduce their friction coefficient, make them more energy efficient. So very, very small amounts, and we're talking about, you know, um, almost few micrograms per ml, um, and the, there was a dramatic reduction in friction coefficient. So, um, and that's, that's because of the crystal structure and the layered nature of these materials and the slippages that they can cause. Um, so so th this is currently, again, uh, there are a few papers in this space that we've published, but ongoing work to, to optimize the process further. Um, last but not the least, um, I spoke about how black phosphorus degrades and it's bad for devices and electronics and any sort of, um, you know, integrated systems we want to make, but, it's very good for a very different kind of application. Um, so bacteria and fungal cells don't like reactive oxygen species. So we actually partnered with our colleagues and experts in microbiology and biochemistry to look at whether this material can actually uh, target these bacterial and fungal cells. And what we found is that within two hours, 
even nanograms of this material was very effective even against antibiotic resistant species which which are um, impossible to kill with normal antibiotics so um, th that was really fascinating and it gives us a lesson in um, in terms of thinking in a way that can you actually utilize some of the deficiencies or the so-called deficiencies of a material it might be really good for another field it might not be good for electronics but it's really good for biology um, so we also performed some cytotoxicity tests um, it has proven to be harmless to healthy cells which is a good sign uh, and currently we are moving into in vitro trials in mouse models uh, to see um, if we can um, uh, scale scale this up further um, and assess its toxicity um, uh, as per regulatory standards. So before I finish, um, I would like to point out, you know, the kind of methodology that we use in, in our team in terms of working. Obviously, our new fundamental discoveries, um, we, we look at industry for the demand. So we look at a lot of industry partners to see what their needs are um, and here is just, just a small list of uh, companies that we collaborate with on um, different kinds of technologies so one of them i've mentioned which we spoke about earlier the color changing uh, patches but there are others as well which i've outlined here and then from the very start once we have the fundamentals pinned down we also liaise with manufacturing partners for example to see if we can actually scale this up towards an actual real world product where we can make it make our research of benefit to to the people um, that's that's kind of the, the 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 flow that that we followed and all these technologies are at different stages of development um, as we speak so ju just a quick recap of capability areas uh, i started off with showing you a snapshot of uh, what we uh, work on here's just a snapshot of the capability areas very broadly just to give you a flavor um, and probably some uh, talking points for any potential uh, collaborations that you might be interested in um, i think yeah, that that was my last slide and of course a big thank you to all our team members the phd students postdoctoral fellows um, all our industry partners funding agencies the australian government the Victorian government and everyone who supports us. And with that, I would like to draw the presentation to a close and thank you again uh, for the invitation to speak and thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you, sir. Now it is open for uh, question and answers. So uh, yeah, uh, there is a uh, question for you from uh, Dr. Arul. So the FET performance was compared for ionic liquid uh, protected phosphoryl FETs with the pristine devices. What are the measured charge carrier mobility values for these devices? And please comment on the role of the dielectric capacitance of ionic liquid on FET characteristics. Yeah, so uh, th that's a very good question. And um, we we actually, uh, when we measured the carrier mobilities, we did not see a huge change in terms of, you know, we did think that there might be some charge transfer that happens, uh, but that did not really uh, materialize, uh, primarily because black phosphorus, as we were operating this in ambient environment, has this tendency of creating a top phosphorus oxide layer that, that prevents the real interaction in terms of when we talk about charge transfer. So uh, as you would have seen, the, the, the field effect curves that I showed um, and look at the slope of the transfer curves, it, it, th there wasn't a huge change. Um, the role of the dielectric capacitance of ionic liquid, um, we actually did not assess that. So we did not measure um, the dielectric uh, capacitance um, and assessed its influence. The, the study was mainly focused on whether we can maintain operational viability for a longer duration of time, but it's a very pertinent point and I think something worth investigating if, if it hasn't been earlier. If it's not us, probably someone else can, but it's a very good point that Dr. Arun makes. Yeah, uh, second question from Dr. N. Raghu. An excellent talk. Can you please throw more light on the chemical free sanitizer? Okay, so I will try to answer that question as specifically as I can. Uh, reason being it's, it's, it's currently under a patent process. 
Um, so essentially, as I said, the the idea is to to actually have an antimicrobial technology, which is when you're talking about, say, even hand sanitizing, which is alcohol-free and solvent-free. So using natural products, integrating some of our materials into it, um, and completely getting rid of, you know, alcohol-based ones, because these are chemicals that, that also go into our ecosystem and ha have a significant effect on uh, different kinds of, you know, livestock, marine life, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's the aim. Um, it's again, a problem that came to us through industry demand. Uh, and we're basically trying to solve them together with them. Hopefully I was able to answer this question as best I, as I could. Yeah, I got the feel for it, but uh, can you throw that, uh, what is that, uh, that kills the uh, bacteria or whatever, like, uh, what is the functional material over there? You are changing the alcohol. That's fine. So, is... so, so, so it's a product that, that the company actually has. So we, we have, okay. So short answer is we are trying to integrate our black phosphorus antimicrobial properties um, into a natural um, product that the company already has. So they basically extract some products from the leaves of trees and we are integrating the black phosphorus material to make it um, in the form of a sanitizer. Quickly asking, uh, will there be the problems of uh, dispersion of your material on that uh, natural product? That will be the key point. Yes, exactly. So, so that, that that that's something that that we have worked through. We we have almost solved that puzzle in terms of getting a high dispersibility without creating agglomerations, um, and that kind of also comes from our prior knowledge of working with black phosphorus, where we have worked with, you know, liquid exfoliation of black phosphorus and suspending it in a stable form for a long duration of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, anybody has a question? Like we can take one more question. Uh, I think uh, no more question. If further question, uh, please contact Dr. Uh, Sumit uh, through mail. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sumit, for your wonderful talk and uh, like more insights into 2D materials for different applications. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invite. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite next uh, speaker. The next speaker is. Uh, Dr. Hidekazu Tanaka. So I'm sorry if I uh, pronounce wrong. And he is a professor at Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Center, Sunken Institute of Scientific and Industrial Research, Research Osaka University, Japan. And the research group of Professor Tanaka is carrying out research on functional harmonized nanomaterials and nano devices using exotic materials such as ferroelectric, ferromagnetic, and semiconducting oxides and also 2D atomic layer materials such as transition metal dichalcogenides. He is the author of uh, more than 250 articles which were published in international peer-reviewed uh, journals and he has uh, around four patents uh, which, uh, which are method of manufacturing uh, low resistive p-type SRTiO3 and LABA MnO3 series room temperature colossal magnetic resistive material, field effective transistor and uh, ferromagnetic semiconductor junction element and he published around eight book chapters and he received many more awards and honors. And I, I will read a few uh, from them. And uh, in 1993, Young Scientist Award from the Japan Institute of Metals. And in 2000, Young Scientist Award uh, from Japan Material Research Society. And in 2001, Young Scientist Award for the presentation of an excellent paper uh, from the Japan Society of Applied Physics. In 2005, Excellent Scientist Award. Uh, the prestigious award is uh, Uchiyama Prize, and in 2015, the best paper award in the 26th Symposium on Phase Change Oriented Science. And he also uh, belongs to various affiliated academic associations, American Society of Material Science, and the Vacuum Society of Japan, and Applied Magnetic Society, and Japan Society of Applied Physics, and Physical Society of Japan. So now I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Professor uh, Tanaka to deliver his talk. Uh, thank you for kind introductions.
No, I share the mice, right? Yeah, uh, presentation. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thank you, Chairman, for kind of introductions. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer to invite this nice conference. Then my name is Hidekatsu Tanaka in, uh, from the Osaka Universities. Today, I'd like to talk about the design and the preparation of the transition metal oxide seam film and the nanostructures for the smart sensing devices. Okay. First, I belong to Osaka Universities. They, as you know, the in Japan, the biggest city is Tokyo. The, this is the political cities. And then Kyoto is the traditional cities. The Osaka is the second largest city in the Japan. Also, very active uh, uh, cities. The, my university is located in the northern part of the Osaka universities, on uh, Osaka areas. So this is the building of the, our institute. The, our institute, Sanken, has nanoscience, nanotechnology centers. The, our nanotechnology center was founded in the April 2002 for developing the bottom-up nanotechnology, top uh, nanotechnologies, and their industrial applications. And also, our nanotechnology center is the first national nanotechnology center founded in Japan. And also, in Japan, uh, Japan government is a push the nano, uh, establishment of the nanotechnology platform Japan. This mission is uh, to establish the reliable research infrastructures for scientific innovations, especially the molecular and the material synthesis, nanofabrications, and advanced characterizations. The Osaka University has a big nanotechnology platforms. And uh, I'm also the vice director of the Sankens and also director of the nanotechnology open facility at Osaka Universities. Then this uh, our nano, uh, nano platform is one of the biggest platforms. There's so many uh, advanced infrastructures. For example, the pulse laser deposition techniques so the material synthesis, nano techniques, the ultra fine the transition uh, electron microscope and so on. So in our non, uh, in institutes, we have the typically the two nano foundries. One is the molecular material synthesis platforms, including the so many thin film deposition systems. And also we have the nano fabrication platforms, including the FYB systems, electron beam lithographies, nano imprint therapy, and all so on. The, our group is uh, uh, constructing the nanostructures, especially the transition metal oxide and also two dimensional materials, combining the material synthesis and also nano uh, fabrication, nano techniques. A typical example is to establish the functional oxide nanoelectronics fields. The combining the two types of the nanotechnologies, one is the bottom up thin film growth. For example, the pulse laser deposition techniques. And also, uh, we'd like to combine the top down nano resolver techniques, typically the nano imprint lithographies and the nano uh, electron beam lithography techniques and, uh, and so on. The two combining the two technologies, we have been fabricating, the, for example, the two dimensional nanostructure of the transition metal oxide. For example, Vanadium dioxide, the phase change materials. Cuprate is a ITC superconductors. Magnetite is a magnetic materials. Nickel oxide is a, these are today's the main uh, topics materials. Hydrogen sensing materials. Then we are fabricating the two dimensional thin film heterostructures and the 3D nanostructures. For example, the nanowires, nanodot structures, and all so once we fabricate this type of nanostructures, we can expect it. Why is the pick up the excellent physical properties in comparison to the bulk materials? And also, this type of two dimensional thin film and nanostructures forms, it is applicable for the industrial applications. For this purpose, we are developing the 
two types of nanotechnologies, and also try to combine the, these two nanotechnologies to promote the uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional nanostructures. This is the background of the, our groups. Okay, today is mainly I would like to focus on the uh, transition metal oxide and interesting materials. Okay, from the recent topics, as you know, the Nobel Prize in the chemistry 2019 rewards the development of the lithium ion batteries. The lithium ion batteries are quite important materials on the environment uh, issues. They typically, among them is Professor John B. Goodwin, who developed the uh, transitional metal oxide or the cathode materials. So, transitional metal oxide they play an important role as the chemistries to the energy storage materials. They, in these systems, uh, ions and the electron interaction is the pretty important role. The not only the ionic motions, transition metal oxide also important in the electron and the spin interactions. That's typical. One of the typical uh, example is Professor Good Enough and Junjiro Kanamori. He is the previous uh, Osaka University president. Uh, proposed the uh, important uh, physical theories. Uh, namely the Kanamori good enough theories. They're using the, this theories, uh, they, are the, they explain why magnetic material shows the ferromagnetic properties. So, transition metal oxide is quite important in the field of the electron spin interaction field to the quantum materials, and also ion uh, sensing and the ion uh, storage materials. So, Controlling the two ways, so the controlling the electric electrons by physical ways, and also controlling the ions by chemical route, we can expect to control the important properties such as the ferromagnetism, phase change properties, high TC superconductor properties, plus the magnetic properties, and, uh, and so on. Okay, so. Uh, this is the outline of my talks. But the first, I'd like to explain the background of my uh, research is how to control the physical properties of transition metal oxide by chemical route and the chemical uh, physical route. Then, I briefly introduce the ferroviscite nickel to thin film and the ion related devices. After that, how to analyze how to design the GIS material to excellent photonic sensing and the electronic devices. The first, I would like to introduce the background of the transition metal oxide materials. The transition metal oxide is uh, quite interesting as a strange semiconductor. This material shows a very huge metal insulator transitions, relatively high temperatures. For example, typical one is the vanadium dioxide. This material shows the insulator to metal transitions over the room temperatures. And also their own ratios, namely resistance change are very huge. Sometimes 10 and 100,000 change can be expected at room temperatures. And once we apply the, this material to the sensing and the switching devices, huge on ratio can be expected by small energy applications. And also this phase transition is very fast. So, Fast uh, switching can be expected. And also, this material shows a much functional properties. For example, electrical switchings, magnetic switchings, superconducting switch can be expected. So, using the, these materials, we can expect the much functional switching device. And not only this, non volatile memories, big configurable device such as brain mimetic uh, memories, and also. This material includes so many spin and ions, even in the 10 nanometer scales. If we fabricate the 10 nanometer scale, the very tiny devices beyond the Moore's laws, we can expect it. This small oxide device shows the excellent physical properties beyond the Moore's rules. So once we can realize the phase switching devices in the transition metal oxide. Uh, this material, this device, that leads to the novel computing paradigm and application field. 
such as uh, this switching device is applicable for the big data processing, sensing, IoT, and trillion sensors, and so on. So this is the motivation of this uh, work. The two control the physical property of the transition met uh, metal oxide. Up to now, so, so many research applied the physical ways. Typical one, the field effect transistors. The ones we com combine the transition metal oxide, typically the high TC superconductors or the gate insulators. Applying the high electric field can modulate the carrier concentrations at the interfaces. So switch around the group to report it. Uh, applying the gatings, superconducting switch our state is the switch is the insulating state. It's a superconducting switching devices. And also, we also fabricated the field effect transistor devices, combining the magnetic oxide with the ferroelectric gating materials. Applying the electric field for the gate materials, we can control the metal insulator transition temperatures and also colossal magnet resistance, the ferromagnet properties also. There's so many researchers try to control the physical properties using the field effect transistor structures. But unfortunately, transition metal oxide includes so many carriers. The two modulate the uh, uh, carrier concentrations at the room temper uh, at the interface effectively. We need the huge number of the carrier modulation are necessary at the interfaces. The typically 10 to 14, 10 to 15 square centimeters sheet carrier change is required at the interfaces. Usually, if we apply the gate insulator, the silicon, SiO2, and the hafnium oxide, upper limit the usually 10 to 13 square centimeters. So, Physical control, you know, such as the FET devices, are good ways, but sometimes very huge electric fields are necessary. It is difficult to induce the phase change using the FET device structures. The alternative ways to control the, the carrier concentrations and the physical properties, chemical route is one of the interesting uh, fields. The typical one is the electrochromic phenomena. The tungsten oxide are very uh, famous materials for the electrochromic. Usually, tungsten oxide the band insulators, the doping the sodium cases. Sodium is the puts the electrons for these materials. So, so many carriers are generated. Transparent state is uh, turned to blue or black. So, Ion doping is uh, one of the effective ways to control the carrier concentrations. The, using the uh, FET devices, screening problems, it is difficult to induce a huge carrier at interfaces. But once we use the ionic doping techniques, ion uh, injections, so easily uh, achieves a huge amount of the carrier that injected this material. For these strategies, perovskite nickel is one of the interesting materials. The 2014's Purdue University group reported colossal resistance change by hydrogen doping in the nickel materials. Usually, samarium nickel oxide is a semi-metal material, physical properties, but once we doped the hydrogen using the platinum catalyst. Eight order change of the resistance we can observe. This is a very huge change. Initially, uh, black material that turned to transparent. And also, doped uh, hydrogen is uh, stored as a proton state is. So applying the electric field, we can expect we can control the motion of the proton with the solid state materials. The doper, the area is controlled by the electric field. So electric resistance also modulated. This is one of the prototype devices. This is the two type mineral electrode. This is the nickel materials. At first, we doped the proton using the platinum catalyst. Then this area is the doped areas. Then apply the electric field 
positively negatively is hydrogen is moved within the thin films, so resistance is slightly modulated. Okay. The, and also an, another application, the sensor techniques. The hydrogen sensing, this is also sen hydrogen sensing material. So also with this material that can detect the pH pH changes. The changing, uh, changing the pH states, resistant drastically change. So even in the small voltage, we can detect the let be large change of resistance. So this hydrogen doped uh, phase transition materials also can be applicable for the hydrogen sensing materials. So how much carriers can be injected by ionic dopings? They usually to control the physical property of the transition metal oxide, FET device is a major route up to now. The once we combine silicon oxide as a gate insulators, we can induce the carriers 10 to 13. Even though high K materials have him oxide, induced carrier is limited also two times the 10 to 13 and less. The ionic liquid gating is one of the powerful techniques. In this case, materials are so stable, we can expect it a 10 to 14. A square centimeter carrier can be induced. However, once we selected the ionic dopings, if that is the source tables, we can expect it. 10 to 15 square centimeter carrier can be injected the uh, materials. So only the, these areas, band chain, uh, bending can be controlled. But if we can dope 10 to 15, uh, cubic uh, square centimeter carriers in these materials, electron structure itself is drastically modulated. So huge change in physical uh, property can be uh, realized using the ion doping techniques, especially the hydrogen dopings. So instead of the solid state devices, if we prepare the ionic doping devices, for example, this ionic liquid sensing, ionic liquid gating, or platinum catalyst, we can inject it, sodium, lithium, the oxygen vacancy of the proton can be injected to transition metal oxide. So beyond the electrostatic modulation limitations, we can realize huge carrier injected and also drastic physical property change can be realized using the ionic uh, doping techniques. So, once we realize ionic dopings for the transition metal oxide, we can expect so many ionic doping induced functionalities. One is the ion of the proton sensing, optical change, transparent to the turn to completely black, for example, smart wind applications. The magnetic properties also tuned, the, so if you did this to good for the spin turns devices, and also, Memory device, protein memories are also uh, interesting ways. Only small amount of the electric field applied to the gates, very huge resistance change can be expected. And also hydrogen and uh, ionic motion is a uh, behave as a uh, synaptic transistors. And also fuel cell is also interesting application field using the ionic doping induced functionalities. Okay. That's typical examples. In these talks, I introduced how to design the ionic doping functionality in the ferrofluoride nickel thin films and application on the ion related devices. The, the ferrofluoride nickel is one of the interesting materials for the international roadmap for the device and semiconductors. The MOT FET is one of the interesting the beyond the CMOS devices. Very huge on ratio can be expected by applying the electro fields. Among them, samarium nickelate is shows the metal insulator transitions or above the room temperatures. And also, this material is a nearly heat set free transistor, particularly interesting to the possibility that there is the integration on the CMOS platforms. And also, ferrocyanide nickel materials, it has been founded 
non-thermal electron doping into a thermal liquid can lead to the colossal increase of resistance. They're using the, this phenomena, so, so the proton-gated transistor can be uh, realized. This uh, transistor shows a very huge of ratios, sometimes lead to an eight-order eight change of the channel resistance. So we using the selected the dispersed the nickel materials, then fabricated the transistors and also sensing uh, thin film devices. The two prepares the thin films, we apply the uh, pulse laser deposition techniques. At first, we prepare the sintered target in the vacuum chambers. They radiate the uh, ultraviolet lasers onto the, this target. Then, ablate atom that reach the substrate, then crystallize at the surface of the substrate. We can get the high qualities, highly crystalline the transition metal oxide film can be fabricated. After this, this, uh, this material shows a clear metal to insulator transitions. This is a typical example of the samarium nickel materials. This material shows the 130 degrees Celsius. It shows the phase transitions. The European nickel oxide, one of the family of the series, this material shows a much higher transition temperatures, almost 200 degrees Celsius. Then we deposit a platinum electrode like this. Then apply the hydrogen dopings uh, using the platinum catalytic effect. At uh, 200 degrees Celsius, the two hours, around the platinum cat uh, catalytic electrode, hydrogen is doped, then black part is turned to transparent. Huge optical change can be observed. And also, resistance is uh, drastically enhanced. Then we up, this material is applied to the FET devices. They, uh, on this, summary nickel thin film exists here. On it, we apply the ion liquid materials as a gate insulators. They apply the electro field, and then at the surface, maybe the hydrogen is injected to the summary nickel materials. There are only the two or three volt gatings. Very huge resistance change can be realized. 10,000 uh, 10 10, resistance modulation ratios are realized in these materials. If why this huge change can be realized, we have analyzed using the XPX uh, measurement. After the gatings, this device shows a huge resistance change. Then we measure the XPS measurement. Then after the gatings, Nickel three plus the turn to the nickel two pluses. So after the gatings, nickel three plus states the reduce the nickel two plus electron doping realize the gatings. Then we plot it the amount of the nickel generate the amount of nickel two plus against the modulation resistance. With increasing the generation nickel two pluses, drastically modulation ratio is uh, increases. So clear relationship we observed. So relationship between nickel two plus and the modulator resistance clearly indicates the creation nickel two plus cause and causes an uh, increase of the modulator resistance. So chemical doping is quite effective to modulate, realize a huge on ratios, this type of the chemical transistors. The first interesting device are two terminal switching devices. This is the two terminal register structures using the perovskite nickel the thin film devices. In these cases, we prepare the neodymium nickel thin films as the channel layers. On it, we deposit the catalytic electrode, and also this is the conventional electrode. Then we apply the catalytic dopings. The time uh, at the high temperature, we doped. Uh, hydrogen near the platinum electrodes under the gas flow systems. Then start to the gas dopings, resistance rapidly enhanced. That near the end, uh, inter uh, boundaries, we found the transparent regions, hydrogen doped areas are realized by gas doping systems. Then this uh, 
proton injection is controlled by, by things. When we apply the positive bias voltage, the two electrode hydrogen injection is accelerated like this. Is. Doped laser is expanded it with increasing the bias voltage 0 to the 10 volt. So this doped area is expanded. On the other hand, we apply the negative bias voltage to block the hydrogen diffusions. So no change observed in the hydrogen doped areas. So using the biasings, hydrogen doping that can be controlled systematically. So we analyze the activation energies, the hydrogen doping systems. After the, under the positive bias voltages, electric field accelerated the hydrogen dopings. Then doping is rapidly expanded, resistance drastically enhanced. On the other hand, we apply the negative bias voltage. So hydrogen diffusion potential barriers are blocked. Low resistance modulation can be observed. The without electrical field, we estimate the activation, uh, thermal activation barrier is about 0.64 electron volt for hydrogen diffusions. The under the electrical field is by 10 volts. This activation barrier energy is modulated to 20%. This data indicates using the biasings, hydrogen sensing, and the hydrogen docking uh, can be controlled so systematically. So, next uh, challenge is uh, enhance the hydrogen diffusion speed using the thin films and the nanotechnology te uh, systems. Okay. There are the preliminary devices. This is the pre uh, protonic oxide devices. The two control the proton motions and the resistance change by electric field. We fabricated the, this type of the trial devices. This is the nickel films. This is a catalytic electrode. Then we doped hydrogens. Then this area that becomes turns transparent and the resistance are enhanced. After that, we apply the only the pure electrode field between two electro, uh, two terminal electrodes. We apply the positive bias voltage. Hydrogen doped is expanded, resistance is slightly enhanced. Then apply the negative bias voltage. Doped area is shrinked, then resistance decreased. This is a protonic uh, type of the devices, phase change memory devices. But in comparison to the gas doping techniques, pure electric field control ratio uh, in the pure electric field modulation devices, on off ratio is not so large, and also switching speed is not so fast. So, next to challenging. We should enhance the diffusion speed by electric field should be enhanced by a nanotechnology uh, systems. The two control the physical properties to modify the physical properties of transition metal oxide. Strain controls in the same film force are quite effective. This is the oxide materials. The ones we combine the virus lattice constant substrate we can control the distance of the oxygen and the transition metal oxide uh, position, uh, distance. So interaction, the spin-spin interactions, ion-spin interactions that can be modulated. This strain control is quite effective technique. Up to now, to modulate the ferroelectric properties by strain controls, magnetic resistance, the magnetic property controlled by strain effect, and also Modulation of the high TC superconduct state also reported in the transition metal oxide. The next, we would like to apply enhance the hydrogen doping effect in the transition metal oxide uh, by strain effect. The two control the lattice structure of the transition metal oxide. We can select a various kinds of substrates. Once we prepare the Calium tantalate, very large lattice constant materials, uh, thin film materials expect to be expanded to lattice constant. On the other hand, lantern aluminum substrate, relatively small lattice constant materials, we can expect it complex strains applied to the interfaces. 
So control the hydrogen motions uh, can be uh, expected. So we have located various kinds of the strained films combining the, this type of the substrate with the neogen nickel thin film materials. The calcium tantalate can uh, apply the tensile strains. Lansanium aluminum substrate can apply the complex strains. This XRD diffraction, this RT pro, uh, electrotransport properties, the fabrication of the strained films that is constantly systematically modulated. So this is the hydrogenation of the nickel films on the various substrate. This is the time dependence and resistance modulation by hydrogen dopings. The ones we prepare the calcium tantalate substrate like this. So this is the platinum electrode, catalytic electrode. Then this yellow part is hydrogen doped areas. So after the dopings from the platinum electrode, doped area they expand it. Then we replace a substrate, strontium titanate, ELSAT, lanthanum aluminate, the compressed strontium materials. With increasing the uh, decrease in the lattice constant, hydrogen doped areas, these areas, rapidly enhanced. And finally, on the lanthanum aluminate substrate, entire regions are completely doped. In comparison to the calcium tantalate substrate, this non reactive area still remains, but once we deplete the runtime aluminum substrate, already is completely doped. This indicates just replacing the substrate, hydrogen diffusion speed is drastically enhanced like this. In accordance with the enhancement of hydrogen diffusion speed, resistance modulation is also drastically modulated. Then in comparison to the Calcium tantalate or strontium titanate substrate, resistance modulation effect is up to the about 100. On the other hand, once we prepare the, this substrate, resistance modulation effect up to the millions. Thousand times enhancement of the realized, just replacement of the substrate. The why so huge effect can be a uh, huge effect is uh, obtained. We analyze the uh, respective surface mappings using the four, four, times of, uh, four types of films. This is the Princeton films, this is a different type of the substrate. The old films show the epitaxial glosses. On the other hand, this is a film, uh, this is a lattice constant of the imprint. Uh, parameter of the derivative of nickelate. Okay, with decrease in lattice constant of the substrate, film lattice constant is almost systematically reduced. Okay, these are relationships, lattice constant of the C films. Okay, with selection of the smaller lattice constant substrate, owing to the strain effect, lattice constant of nickel film also shrinks. Simultaneously, with decrease the lattice constant, resistance modulation effect drastically enhanced. So, compressive strain in these cases quite effective, enhance the hydrogen sensing properties. Using the conventional substrate, once we prepare the runtime aluminum substrate, 10 times or a uh, thousand times enhancement of sensitivity can be uh, realized. The why such kind of effect obtained, we uh, to make clear, we also calculated the hydrogen motion using the DFD calculations. So this is a typical hydrogen migration path in the perovskite nickel. This is a typical path. Is hydrogen Usually, hydrogen is located near the oxygen atoms. Then, apply the electric field or thermal diffusions. Hydrogen moves to the neighboring ions, uh, oxygen. Then, most higher energy part is the reaction code in the number nine, located here. In these positions, at first, hydrogen start to separate the oxygen O1. 
then chemical bonding the breaking on this point is. Then once we prepare the compressive strain subs uh, you know, substrate, oxygen bond uh, distance O1 and O2 the drastically enhanced, uh, reduced, then potential barriers are reduced. So once we prepare the complex strains for the perovskite the nickel films to oxygen bond distance uh, compressed, then activation barrier is reduced. So owing to the, this reduction of the potential barriers, uh, we can expect it's a very huge diffusion, uh, faster diffusion is realized. This is the strain dependence of the diffusion barrier energy changes. We can we are apply the compressed strains, potential barriers systematically reduced in comparison to the tensile strain films. In case of the tensile strain films, potential barriers are about 0.8 electron volt, a little bit huge. But we apply the compressed strains, only the 0.4 electron volt in the barrier energy is calculated. So, owing to the reduction of this potential barrier energies, rapid diffusion is hydrogen realized. And then finally, huge enhancement is the sensitivity of the hydrogen is realized. This technique in the future expanded the material designings. The perovskite nickel is famous as the Systematic control is realized for the substitution of the A type A site cations. Currently, we use the neogen cations, they have the large ionic radiuses, but we reduce the samarium, europiums, ionic radius are reduced. Then, oxygen oxygen distance are reduced. So this is a theoretical calculation result is activation barrier is also reduced. So, this indicates if we reduce the small ionic radius materials, some of them are and Europeans, much faster diffusion device can be realized. So leading to the enhancement of sensitivity of the hydrogen sensing. Finally, uh, we would like to introduce a more giant of sensitive resistance modules on how to realize using the nuclear reaction analysis for the hydrogen phase diagrams. Currently, we don't know how much hydrogen induced the disperovskite nickel. So using the, this nuclear reaction analysis, using the nuclear collision with the nitrogen atomic beams, nitrogen atomic beams that react to hydrogen within the solid state materials, then change it to the gamma rays. So to analyze the gamma rays amount, we can simultaneously, uh, quantitatively analyze the amount of the hydrogens. Using these techniques, we analyze the how much hydrogen induces this perovskite nickel materials. This is the deep profile for the hydrogen sensing near the platinum catalytic electrode. The entire films, hydrogen doped. If we dope with the relative high temperatures, almost 1.0 hydrogen injected one perovskite radius. The perovskite nickel can store a huge amount of hydrogen. And also, this is the material dependence neogen nickel, samarium nickel. In case of samarium nickel, smaller lattice constant materials, much higher hydrogen can be stored within the materials. So this is the phase, hydrogen phase diagrams. Initially, undoped material, relatively low resistance, uh, the uh, is a appeared. They with ejected hydrogens, slightly enhanced the resistance, then about 0.4 hydrogen in the one perovskite lattice, resistance suddenly enhanced. This is the hydrogen induced motor transitions. This is the phase diagram for the summary of nickel cases. In these materials, 0.2 hydrogen is stored at the lattice. Very huge phase transition occurs. Eight order change in resistance observed. So, if we prepare the initial doped level is about 0 0.2, then we apply the hydrogens. Quite a huge change can be expected. So, on ratio the design to these equations, to quick response, large uh, 
high, mobi higher mobility of the ionic mobility are required. The two enhance the sensitivities depending on this phase diameter. Huge resistance change against the hydrogen amount is required. The if we prepare the, this initial hydrogen doping levels, very high sensitivity can be realized to these materials. And finally, one of the techniques to enhance the hydrogen sensing is nanostructure is one of the good ways. Then in our groups, we can fabricate the oxide nanostructure using the combination of the top-down and the bottom-up nanoprocess techniques. They usually, nano strategy for the transition metal oxide is quite difficult. The reason why the transition metal oxide are very hard materials. But once we prepare the nano template uh, like this, using the nano embryo dissolved techniques, and then we apply the pulse laser deposition techniques the, on, to apply the sidewall, sidewall growth, the transition metal oxide. The, if we apply the, these techniques, only just adjustment to the deposition times, we can control the wire widths systematically beyond the limitation of the top-down nanolithography techniques. And using these techniques, we can fabricate several type of the oxide nanostructures. At the first, we prepare the nanoscale template, then apply the sidewall deposition of transmitter oxide. They just controlling the deposition times we can fabricate a very narrow oxide wire, nanowire systems. This is the vanadium oxide or nanowall systems. This is the wire width of 40 nanometers. This is a magnetite or nanowall structures, zinc oxide or nanowall structures, perovskite uh, manganite, magnet resistant nanowall system can be fabricated. And using the, this type of techniques, we can fabricate also nickel nanostructure fabricated. Easily skips. Once we prepare the nanowire and microwires for hydrogen induced materials, then we reduce the wire widths 100 micrometer to the 200 nanometers. Hydrogen sensing speed is much enhanced. And also, we control the gap distance at 20 micrometer to 2 micrometers. They also, hydrogen. Uh, sensing speed is enhanced. So to enhance the hydrogen sensing speed in the resistant modulations, in addition to the mobility controls, doping level controls, non-structure is also one of the effective tools to enhance the hydrogen sensing devices. So in future, much higher hydrogen sensing devices we can propose the material design for superior proton devices. The replacing the uh, ASI to cations, that is the engineering, and also applying the multiplied uh, effects of strain controls, and also nanostructure controls, give and faster, more giant change the hydrogen in the mode transitions. So combination of the these type of the techniques in futures, we can realize much higher sensitivities, uh, hydrogen sensing, and also hydrogen switching devices. And finally, I'd like to mention the future applications. In this uh, symposium sections, previous two invited speakers uh, give a talk the two dimensional materials. For example, the flexible electronics. The transition metal oxide also deposit for the two dimensional materials. And this is the hexaboron nitrides, um, uh, hexaboron nitride, uh, single crystalline flakes. They will need, owing to the fundi bondings at the surface on the two-dimensional materials, perovskite, nickelate, vanadium dioxide, magnetic magnetite, also fabricated. They once fabricated this transition metal oxide on the two-dimensional materials. This flakes are transferable transfer for the other substrates. For example, the vanadium dioxide, the two-dimensional materials of flakes can be transferred to the silicones polymers, glass, gold, and the papers. So transition metal oxide have the very uh, rich functionalities. And also combination of the two dimensional materials, transition metal oxide also applicable for the flexible electronics. OK, this is the final uh, slide is the future perspectives. Ion doping of the transition metal oxide 
that can be tuned the property of transition metal oxide uh, through the structural orbital, the charge of the spin degree of freedoms. They're using the ion doping technique to the transition metal oxide, it is applicable for the switching devices, hydrogen sensing, and also other fields, electronics, energy, and emerging applications expected. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Tanaka. Um, due to time constraints, uh, we may take a couple of questions from audience. Professor Tanaka. Yeah. Um, when you say hydrogen doping in samarium nickelate, yeah. uh, what exactly this hydrogen uh, it goes and occupies which position actually? Okay. I think slide 27, you have shown some picture. Okay, okay. Uh, the, yeah. 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 In so, theoretical calculations, most stable point is that zero and, uh, for example, this zero positions, namely the uh, hydrogen is uh, bonded to the oxygen ions. This okay. is stable. Then move to the neighboring ions. At first, rotate the oxygen ions. This is the first. Uh, at potential bias, then uh, reach the second stable point near the oxygen. Then cutting the hydrogen bonding to the ox oxygen, then this state is relatively high energies. They again, reach the stable point 17, uh, 15. This area is also stable near the oxygen uh, ions. Okay. So basically, hydrogen is the form of chemical bonding with oxygen ions in the transition metal oxide. Uh, uh, oxygen ions. Okay. And you are observing hydrogen ion uh, mobility as a function of uh, electric field voltage yeah. applied. So this hydrogen is moving as a function of applied voltage. Yes. Yes, 21, yes. It, the positive bias voltage, so uh, I, uh, I didn't show the plus four, plus six volt. So with increasing the positive bias voltage, gradually and systematically enhanced. Okay. Diffusion lengths, and also we apply the negative bias voltage. This diffusion is blocked, so this diffusion length is quite limited. Okay, thank you. Usually applying the 10, 10 volt is mm, enhancement of the diffusion is a one or two micrometer is realized. So there yeah. is a there is a structural distortion. The octahedra is uh, doing, getting some rotation. <laughs> MO6 octahedra, nickel oxygen octahedra is getting rotation due to, due to hydrogen bonding. Taking the XRD diffractions, maybe elongated the oxygen octahedra. <coughs> okay. Not rotated, looks like. Please look at 30, 3, 0. This one? Yes. So, but it's very interesting. Uh, we can discuss at some other point of time through email. Okay, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Tanaka, for uh, insightful talk on uh, perovskite thin films and nanostructures for uh, smart hydrogen sensing. And thank you very much. So now I would like to call uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Deepu John.
and Dr. Deepu John is, a, is an assistant professor at the School of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, University of College Dublin. And previously, he was a postdoctoral research at the Bioelectronics Lab, uh, National University, Singapore. Uh, and also worked as a senior engineer at Sanyo Semiconductors Japan. And he is a recipient of the Institution of Engineers Singapore Prestigious Engineering Achievement Award in 2011 and the Best Design Award at the Asian Solid State uh, Circuit Conference in 2013 and the IEEE Inc. Professional Recent and Individual Award in 2013. He is a reviewer for several IEEE journals and conferences and has served as a guest editor for IEEE T Bio course and IEEE T course 2 and Willie IJCTA. And his research interests include low power biomedical circuit design, energy efficient signal processing, and edge computing. And he is a senior member of uh, IEEE also. Now I would like to uh, invite Dr. Deepu, uh, Deepu Johan uh, for his uh, uh, talk to present his talk. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Chandra, for the introduction. So let me share my screen. One second. Um, is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, yeah visible. All right. Um, All right. Um, no. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. And thanks for the wonderful okay. talk by Dr. Tanaka. Um, so we were listening about materials, uh, how they can be used. Uh, interestingly, this is a talk about how you can use those sensors built using different materials for health monitoring. So it's a slightly different topic. Uh, it's more about applying machine learning and signal processing for uh, wearable IoT sensors. So this is a work done originally by uh, my graduate student, Dr. Shiva Varan. So he happened to graduate, he already graduated. So I, I, I'm delivering this talk here. And, and the talk is about uh, a lightweight neural network for anomaly detection in IoT ECG devices. Now, just to give some background uh, about the research. Oh, oh, before starting, this is a talk which is uh, timed for like 20, 25 minutes. So I'll finish pretty early then. Uh, about the schedule. So let's uh, look at the background of this research. Uh, so based on the data from World Heart Federation, cardiovascular disease is one of the leading cause for death and disability worldwide. Uh, it causes one by third of all global deaths. And uh, we spend a lot of money annually for the treatment of cardiovascular disease. And uh, this is not counting the indirect expenses such as productivity loss or uh, other uh, expenses due to these CVDs. Now, this is not new information and uh, people have attempted to come up with different solutions. And the, the main consensus among researchers and academia is that if you can continuously monitor your physio physiological signals such as electrocardiogram, um, then you can take proactive action um, and therefore we can hopefully reduce cost and risk associated with the cardiovascular disease. Now, the idea is, uh, idea has been around for a while. You use this kind of tiny wearable connected sensors, which you stick to your body and collect or acquire biomedical signals. And this signal is uh, transmitted to a cloud server through your 4G phone or 5G phone. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud server, you have some algorithms running in the background 24 seven monitoring and they're making um, uh, any predictions or doing the analytics so that if there is an anomalous condition that is potentially anomalous, then you can have an instant feedback and um, uh, at least go get some, maybe look for a, a defibrillator or call uh, a 911 or a rescue number. So that's the main idea here. Although the idea has been around for a while and probably for the last 10, 12 years, several challenges regarding wearability of these sensors, longevity of monitoring, data quality, etc. remain. 
So uh, before going to the actual work, just to give some uh, idea of how the sensor looks like. So this is a block diagram of a sensor, of a wearable IoT sensor. So you can see there is a data acquisition part, which is a, usually a single chip, which has an amplifier, analog to digital converter, et cetera. And it acquires the signal, amplifies it, converts to digital domain. And you have a RF radio frequency transmitter, which could be a Bluetooth or a Zigbee transmitter. And you, you may have a microcontroller or some dedicated uh, DSP uh, hardware. You may also have some memory. And the idea is um, this device can acquire the data and transmit to your uh, handheld device, such as your phone. Now, if you look at the power consumption of such a device, what we find is around 90% of all the power of this device is consumed by the wireless transmitter. Uh, so that means the first, first half of the chip or, or the sensor consumes probably less than 5% of the power. Right? So, so one of the issues, so if you go to a hospital with, uh, let's say chest pain, the doctor asks you to wear a device called a halter monitor, all right? for probably two to, weeks, two to three weeks. So the reason is you need to have a long-term monitoring or long-term data observation to figure out what is going on or what is going wrong. The reason being many of these uh, cardiac anomalies occur very infrequently and they are very sporadic in nature. So you need to look at probably 30 days of data to get a high diagnostic yield. If you just get an ECG at a uh, hospital setting that is for like a few minutes. You can only figure out what is um, persistent, but most of the times, many of these anomalies are not persistent and they are sporadic or infrequent. So we need a long-term continuous monitoring, probably in the range of 30 days, which is what the typical halter monitors uh, collect the data for. Now, as, since we have a lot of power being consumed by the RF transceiver, is that 90% of the power is consumed by RF transceiver. What happens is if you build a tiny wearable device with uh, such a setting, it'll last for one day or two days maximum. Assuming you have a reasonably sized battery, something like 500 milliampere MAH battery. Now therein lies the problem. So you cannot use the wearable device uh, for a practical long-term monitoring. So the reason is the power consumption is still too high because of the continuous RF transmission through Bluetooth or Zigbee. Now, what is the solution? The solution is you can disable the RF transceiver when you don't need to transmit. So that means if you have a, uh, some kind of data analytics integrated into the sensor itself, uh, some kind of edge algorithm, then the algorithm uh, can do the analytics on the sensor and only enable an RF transmission if uh, the data is deemed anomalous by that algorithm. So this way, your RF transmitter is not working 24-7. It, it is only working when the algorithm decides and there is an anomaly and probably more uh, comprehensive analysis need to be taken by the clinicians or the doctors. So, uh, so there are a lot of algorithms to analyze, uh, especially machine learning kind of algorithms to analyze biomedical data. But all those algorithms right now are designed to work in the cloud server where Things like computational complexity, battery power, et cetera, are not limitations. But if you want to bring those algorithms to the sensor side where you only have a tiny battery and you have only tiny computational power, typically it's something like a very small ARM Cortex processor, then you need to really look into the aspect of complexity and uh, uh, implementation, how much, how much hardware you need. So this kind of memory footprint, these kind of things. So that is where this research is focusing on. We, are, we have done, what we've done is we developed a lightweight neural network. Of course, you have all sorts of uh, deep neural networks with um, maybe hundreds of layers, which does um, all sorts of uh, classification jobs. But our contribution is more on developing a very lightweight neural network, which basically classifies the data uh, into two classes, which is anomalous, anomalous data and nor normal data and disable the transmission or gate the wireless transmission if you have an anomalous data. Sorry, if you have a normal data, only the data is transmitted only if you have an anomaly in, detected in your biomedical data. So that's the main area. 
uh, in addition to uh, in addition to this power consumption problem, we also have the problem of connectivity and latency and autonomy. So what happens if you don't have 4G or Bluetooth connection? So what happens if the phone, battery of your phone dies or you're traveling in a, let's say, high-speed rail and you lose the connection? So those kind of situations require your edge device or the IoT sensors to have some intelligence built in. Um, so as I said, local analysis of ECG data at the point of capture can reduce power consumption. And only data analysis results need to be transmitted if the data is uh, deemed to be anomalous. So what happens if the data is normal? If your biomedical data is normal, you can just simply ignore it or store it in a local memory like a NAND flash. So there are, as I said, there are existing approaches for uh, biomedical data classification. Um, lots of deep neural network algorithms, but most of them work with this assumption. You have an IoT sensor, and that sensor is uh, uh, is a dumb sensor which doesn't have any intelligence. Just do the data acquisition and transmission, and the, all the intelligence is in the cloud, where you have all sorts of data processing, long term and short term storage, analysis, etc. So most of these current algorithms of uh, ECG data classification attempts to do what we call a multi-class classification, which means you, you can um, figure out what type of specific anomaly is existing in your heart based on the data. Now, that can, the problem with the multi-class classification in, in neural network is that it takes more computational resources than let's say a two-class classification. <clears throat> So these multi-class <clears throat> multi classifiers are inherently more complex in terms of uh, computational requirements, and therefore it has to be done in a cloud server. But in our uh, tiny wearable IoT sensor or the edge of the network, you really have limited computational resources. Therefore, a binary classification of data uh, into, simple, into simply normal versus abnormal is more suitable for uh, lower complexity uh, applications. And so the idea is if you have normal data, you don't do any, anything. If you have abnormal data, you enable a transmission and transmit the data. And, and the fact is most of the time the data is normal um, and uh, in many cases. So therefore you only have a RF transmission very less frequent and that saves the power of your sensor. And you can still do multi-class classification as a second step in the cloud server. Once you have the data transmitted to the cloud, um, you can still do a, a more comprehensive multi-class classification using uh, data analytics algorithms. And that is what we propose. We divide a typical um, classifier, which usually does um, a multi-class ECG classification into two steps. One is stage one and the second is stage two. In stage one, you, you do a simple binary classification and the results are uh, the, uh, of the classifier is just either it's normal or not normal. And based on that result, you enable or disable or gate the wireless transmission of the sensor. And if the data is abnormal, that data is transmitted to the cloud where you have a much uh, deeper neural network, uh, which does a multi-class classification to different anomalous class. And also, if you look at the existing uh, approaches on this classification, you can see this particular data set called MITBH Altimia data set. Now, that is uh, actually uh, not a huge database. It has only 40 records, and, and that is the only available annotated labeled um, data set uh, for this application. But the main problem is uh, the data set is an imbalanced data set. So by an imbalanced data set, what we mean is you have a, a majority class and a minority class, maybe 90 or 99% of all the data is from a particular majority class. And therefore, if your algorithm um, just predict all the time your data is from the majority class, then you still get 99% accuracy, which doesn't make sense because you are really interested in the abnormal data. So what we have is an imbalanced data set for this kind of application, which causes some problem, which causes a problem called overfitting, uh, to be precise. And, uh, and therefore it, it is beneficial if you can um, come up with some solution to augment the data to avoid this overfitting. And the data is, 
the existing data set is sampled at 360 hertz, which is an unusual number for like a sensor. And the existing algorithms don't follow what we say the AMI recommendation. AMI is uh, it's an uh, association for medical instrumentation, which sets the uh, uh, best practices. And if you want to get an FDA approval for your device, you probably have to follow this recommendation by this uh, association for medical instrumentation. So many of the existing works are a bit ad hoc and they don't follow exactly the recommendation and therefore it's probably not really useful uh, for a practical application. And, and the more, another important aspect is most of these existing algorithms are not tested on previously unseen subjects. So I, I think all of you are familiar with the idea that these machine learning algorithms that we people develop, they work really well on the test data, on the data set you are testing it with. But when you see, when you uh, use a new data set or test it with a newer data set, which the algorithm is not trained on, right? So you, you get really uh, poorer results. So that is one issue as well with the existing uh, set of algorithms. So we use the same data set, which I mentioned, the Fizonet MIT Athenia database, uh, primarily because that is the only or the most comprehensive data set available publicly. It's not easy for us, uh, any group to collect your own data set. And this data set uh, has 48 records uh, each of 30 minutes. And they are actually filtered, they remove the noise. They are two lead ECG records. And there are lots of uh, noise parameters like baseline wander and uh, muscle noises. So we did some data cleaning steps by denoising the signal using discrete wavelet transform. We removed the power line noise with a symbol um, IAR notch filter, uh, which is at 60 hertz. And re we resampled the data from 360 hertz to 250 hertz, just because most of the existing sensors work at this typical number. And uh, this is the same data set as I mentioned before, and therefore it has this issue that is class imbalance. And what we did is we augmented the minority class with an augmentation approach called uh, SMART. SMART stands for Synthetic Minority uh, Class Oversampling Technique. So this algorithm is used to oversample the minority data so that you can train your model uh, using this uh, uh, synthetic data. And hopefully it is going to do the overfitting less compared to the previous uh, approach. So reduce the overfitting with this uh, SMART algorithm. Now, as I said, this is not a new um, problem and there are lots of existing solutions. So the existing solutions, if you look at uh, in, the, in the space is basically you use some kind of rule-based approach, some kind of deep learning approach such as the convolutional neural networks and so on and so forth. So, but in this approach, what we are looking at is to use uh, what we call as a recurrent neural network. Now the recurrent neural network is, um, uh, is a neural network where you have a feedback from the output to the input. So it's similar to the IAR filter versus the FIR filter, if you're familiar with the signal processing uh, terminology. So the normal neural networks, what you see is the, uh, what we call as the feed forward neural network. So there is no connection from the output to the input. So you have an input and you get a corresponding output. But if you have a feedback, you can have what we call the state memory. So you can remember data from the past so you can make a prediction for, for the current input, not just based on the current input, but also from the all the data that you have seen in the past. Now, the advantage of using this kind of neural network is that, of course, the size of the network will be much smaller because you have state memory, which collects data from the past. Uh, and uh, the other advantage is that the data that we're looking at is uh, predominantly time series data. So you really have to know what has happened in the past to see if there is a drastic change. And uh, that would be an anomaly in the data. So that is the reason why we use neural, uh, recurrent neural network. And there are different flavors for this recurrent neural network. I suggest you look up some of the um, literature available in the web. So the, the vanilla flavor for this RNN is what we show on here. This is a gate, simple gate in the RNN. So the problem with this vanilla flavor is that it has what we call the memory uh, or, or shorter memory effect. So 
you can you can have the output only based on very recent input. So there is an advanced version, a more fine-tuned version of the vanilla flavor, what we call the LSTM. Um, this is the LSTM cell here. So it has certain switches and controls where you can remember data or it has long-term memory. So if, even if the data comes 10 seconds or 10 minutes ago, it is relevant. The cell can store the state from 10 minutes ago by doing some controls for the switches. So what we are using in this um, project is the LSTM uh, based approach because we uh, need to have a memory of the past. So here is the model that we have come up with. So I will give an approximate intuition to this model. And, uh, and then, uh, so just like any other neural network model development, you start with an intuition of what you're trying to do and then fine tune the network by training the hyperparameters or adjusting the parameters. So that is exactly what we have done here as well. So we have two main blocks. One is the LSTM layer, which works on the, the shape, morphological features of the biomedical or uh, electrocardiogram signal. And then you have a simple feed forward MLP layer, which stands for the multi-layer perceptron network. And that is a simple artificial, the neural network. So the LSTM cell or the LSTM network is going to look at the shape of the signal by extracting the principal component features from the past data. So we extract the PCA uh, coefficients of the data based on certain principal axis. And that information is fed into the LSTM layer. And we also have the time domain information, temporal information based on RR interval. So RR interval is the peak to peak interval in ECG signal. So there are several features that you can derive uh, based on this peak to peak interval. So we derived certain set of features such as the RR, current RR, previous RR, average RR interval, and then the standard deviation of uh, some of the RR interval and some index. These are, these are standard uh, heart rate variability analysis features used in literature. And we, we took those features based on um, certain uh, experiments. So these are the five features that we used as the temporal features of the RR interval. And as I said, we also have the PCA coefficients of the ECG signal. Now, both of those data is uh, given to these separate networks and the output is concatenated. And finally, we have a final classification layer, which is again a simple MLP layer to generate the final output. So that is the, uh, the architecture of the model. And, and here is some illustration of the PCA input so you can see there the blue line is a typical normal beat and the, the orange line is a typical uh, ventricular uh, fusion beat. So N and V beat. So based on, so these are the PCA coefficients of the different beats. So you can see uh, the N beat has most of its energy focus in this area. Um, so let me see. Okay, so in, in this area, the first one, second one. So it's a little bit di distributed as well. Um, L, V, S, and F. So these these five, six classes are different classes of these. Basically. And so these are the PCA coefficient for uh, the N bit. And the orange one is a, a anomalous bit for which you can see the PCA coefficients are focused on the L and V, which are different types of classes uh, for the CGC. Now, so if I go back to the previous slide, so you have this LSTM block here, which is again expanded here. So in the LSTM block, we have one single LSTM cell, uh, which is uh, what we what I've seen uh, shown you before, uh, the exact same cell. Um, so I have one of those cells there. And so, as, as I said, this is a recurrent network. So you need to loop it a couple of times before you take the output. And so this network is recurrent five times with an index five. So you have data from PCA data from the past five um, beats, ECG beats, and that data is um, looped through this LSTM cell. And your final output is again, um, uh, compressed from 10 to two using this MLP layer, right? So ML, this is again a simple multi-layer perceptron network. 
and the output of that MLP layer uh, is again put made into a 10 uh, size vector, uh, which is given to the final classification layer. So you have a 10 size vector here, which comes from five different beads. So each bead generate two outputs here. And um, in, in final, you have 10 of these beads. So this is used along with, you have 10 here, and this is used along with the MLP layer to do the final classification. Now, in this uh, project, we have started with the floating point version of the algorithm, but uh, eventually we want to implement it in IoT wearable sensor, which is actually a fixed point uh, device. So all the low cost hardware is a fixed point device usually. Now, the typical way of doing this is by doing the floating point algorithm development in MATLAB or Python or something, and then you just convert the floating point arithmetic to fixed point arithmetic by putting some limits uh, on the bit width of uh, each point of the integer. Now that is okay, but one problem is you cannot exactly predict what will be your output. So in this uh, project, what we did is we, instead of doing that, we created a fixed point model of the network to train the model as well. So we started with the floating point model, we converted to a fixed point model, and then that fixed point model is retrained with a bit accurate mo uh, model that is generated with some kind of approximation functions, which I show you soon. So once we have the fixed point model, we converted that fixed point model into a C code, which is implemented in an embedded hardware device. And, and we also looked at what are the fractional points. So if you implement anything in a bit limited hardware, so if you only have 32 bits, you, you cannot you have to make sure you're using those 32 bits um, wisely. So we have done some simulations on finding the exact number of fractional bits or the minimum number of fractional bits uh, needed. So based on our simulations, we found maybe at least six fractional bits are needed to get uh, this model to work. Now, as I've shown you before, in the LSTM cell, you have different types of uh, activation functions. So these are usually um, exponential functions or uh, such as, as I've as I shown here. For example, sigmoid function is e raised to x by e raised to x plus one. Now that is the, the thick blue line here. Sorry, now the thick red line here. If you have to implement this in a, um, fixed point arithmetic that is going to be typically done using some kind of lookup table. Now that is not the easiest thing to do because you need to retrain the network. So what we did is we came up with an approximation for the sigmoid function, which looks like this based on all available mathematical identities. And then we implemented this approximate version, which looks like this dotted blue line or dotted red line now to retrain the model in a bit accurate way. So once we have the model based on the bit accurate approximate version, then we deploy that model into the, the uh, embedded hardware device. So this is the approximate model and this can be converted to a fixed point model with a specific number of fractional bits. Similarly, for the TANH activation function, um, so just to, just to give you a quick idea, the activation functions are used to limit the value of a neural network within some limits. For example, in this case, if you pass any input to a sigmoid function, you're limiting the value between zero and one. Because all these networks are non-linear in nature, you don't want the value to explode. And, um, uh, and therefore you use this kind of activation function after doing every multiplication or addition operation. So the TANH is another type of activation function where you limit the output from uh, minus one to plus one. Uh, again, the same story, you have an equation for the TANH activation function. We basically convert it into a fixed point model uh, using all the available uh, identities. And then we implemented the fixed point model as a bit accurate model in, uh, in our embedded device. So now we have developed our fixed point model. How did we test it? So we use this test setup for testing our model. Now, this is a Nordic Semiconductor um, NRF52 development kit, where you have the Bluetooth SOC along with the Cortex-Arm M4 processor, which is a very tiny 
um, uh, microcontroller unit. Now we also have a power measurement device, which is the power profiler kit. This is again given by this particular chip manufacturer to measure the power consumption of the, uh, the Bluetooth SOC and the hardware. And we also have this small uh, bridge, which is the USB to SPI bridge, because we have the uh, sensor data in our PC and to transmit that data from the PC to this board, we need to have a USB to, to SPI bridge. SPI is a, uh, a serial peripheral interface protocol where you convert the data bit or transmit the data bit by bit, uh, unlike parallel uh, data transfer protocols. Now, here is a block diagram of our hardware setup. So we have the data, which is uh, in MATLAB in PC, and that is resampled to 50 Hertz. We did all the filtering, noise removal, et cetera. And we also have a flag for the uh, R peaks because that is assumed to have done um, by other people. So we have the flag for the RP and that data is transmitted via the USB interface to a PC. And these are the things or the model inside the development kit. We have a ring buffer to collect the data. And then once you have the data, we have a, a PCA coefficient calculation. And then we also calculate the RR interval features and then give to the um, light neural network model, which is what we call as ANET. And all right, so now we have the test setup ready. So we trained the model and tested it. These are the results. So initially when we trained the model using floating point and uh, with a five minute global training with this mod augmented data, we got an accuracy of 81% and a sensitivity of uh, 93%. So uh, then as a second step, we did we removed the small data or the synthetic data and then did a global training for which we got an improved accuracy of 92%. And then as a third step, we did a patient-specific training for the global data. Um, now patient-specific training means you train the uh, model using the specific patient's data, which is not really practical if you are in a hospital setup, but most of the published literature includes this number as well. So we did that as well, which is what we got as 97%. So 81%, 92 and 97. And we have the corresponding fixed point equivalent versions as well. So we have 84, uh, 94 and 96. Interestingly, the fixed point number is slightly better than the floating point number for, um, for this model. Usually it's the other way around. And we have, uh, we have, uh, avoided the issue of previously unseen data by splitting the data into two data sets, DS1 and DS2, where we use the only one data set to train the model. And DS2 is not seen by the model before. And we tested the model on only DS2, which means the data that is seen by the model is never used for training. That means you avoid, it's like seeing new data, which, which has been never used before. And that is how we tested our model. Therefore, these numbers are more reliable than what you get in a typical um, research article because this is uh, tested on unseen data or real world data. And we also have a, another test protocol where you train the model using 70% of the ECG and tested with the remaining 30 set as 30% uh, as test data set, where also we get uh, uh, around 97% accuracy. So these are the individual records uh, in the data set. And for each record, we have the uh, corresponding accuracy of false positives and false negatives reported. And this is the average um, accuracy, specificity, sensitivity, et cetera, reported for this entire model. Now here is an interesting graph. Now you can see this is the power, this plot shows the power consumption of data when there is no uh, uh, analytics implemented at the sensor. So by default, we use, we, this is the, the, the thick black line is the power consumption, which is 12.68 microampere. So if we continuously transmit the data, that is the amount of current we use um, or average current we use. Now, if you gate the transmission using the classifier, then this is the number for the average current. 
which is significantly less um, than the uh, the actual number, uh, much lower. Uh, so, but it varies based on record to record because the number really depends upon how much anomaly you have. Not um, so if you constantly transmit, you you have a higher power, and you less frequently transmit, and you have a lower power. Again, this is not an ideal or typical situation because this is a pre-recorded data set with anomalous ECG recordings. In real life, you have the anomalous data very less frequently, probably once in 20 days. So therefore, um, so in this case, the, the transmission is still working for 40%. So in real life, you will have your transmitter working for maybe less than 2%. So although these are the numbers reported based on a specific data set, uh, what we think is the real life numbers of power savings could be much, much better. And here is a comparison of the complexity of our model with the existing work. So we did comparisons on a number of factors, such as the number of parameters, number of multiplications, additions, and uh, divisions. And then we use all this to calculate the number of instructions per classification. So instruction in terms of uh, how many clock cycles, instruction cycles will be used for a specific processor. In, in our case, we use the ARM Cortex M4 processor, which is a, a reasonably sized processor for uh, this kind of application. And if you use the instruction um, as, uh, instructions per multiplication and division, then adding all these additions and multiplication, we get, we need 19,500 instructions per classification, assuming if you are using our model which is actually much, much lower compared to some of the deep neural network, which is implemented using convolutional neural networks or even the other um, filters. So the idea is our model is really, really small. So if you put it in a picture representation, you can see the size is really small and uh, compared to the existing uh, models and the accuracy is pretty high. So that almost concludes my talk. Uh, I would like to also bring your attention to some of the limitations. So as with any, any of these kind of data analytics project, one of the main limitation of our work is that uh, we tested on a single database, which is not really probably enough. We, in the future, we plan to test on more uh, elaborate data setup. But one problem that we face is that we don't have a label annotated data, which is very hard if you have a sick patient in a hospital, you cannot, uh, it's very, really difficult to get those uh, data and annotate it, make it publicly available. So that is one limitation. So we only have limited data set. So another data set, another limitation with this work is our accuracy is around 97%. I mean, uh, as high as it is, probably we really want something like 100% because if you turn off the transmitter when the classification is, um, uh, classification classifier says the output is abnormal or normal, and it turns out to be abnormal, we are going to lose that data, which could prove catastrophic. So false negative can be costly in this approach. To, to counter that issue, what we plan to do is to increase the sensitivity at the expense of accuracy. So you, even if you have a, adjust the threshold to the point that even if you have a small concern that the data is going to be anomalous, you transmit it. So there is a trade-off. The trade-off is that accuracy will be slightly lower, but if we can increase the sensitivity, that issue can be solved. And some of the numbers we reported is for patient-specific training, which is not really practical. But, but so the non-patient-specific number is something like 94% or 95%. So but most of the publications report this number, so we just reported it just for the sake of comparison. So in summary, I proposed a long, so we proposed a long short-term memory-based architecture for ECG classification. The network takes an input feature based on PCA and our unreal features. And we have proved that uh, the accuracy is quite high in, com in comparison with the state-of-the-art techniques and the model has much lower complexity. And we actually implemented the model in embedded C uh, into an embedded device and tested it to verify and it significantly reduced the overall system power consumption. So this work is actually uh, published in a journal in IEEE transactions on biomedical circuits and systems where uh, a lot more details about this work is available. 
So that's the end of my talk. Um, I will be happy to take any questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Deepu. Now it's uh, open for questions. So I can see a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Maybe I can start with answering those. Can you comment, comment on the effect of noise in measurement in classification system? Now, if you, if you remember one of my fir first slide, um, so the first slide, so the first slide it talks about one of the challenging challenges to many is the data quality. So that is one issue with wearable sensors. If you go to hospital, you're lying down on a bed and collecting your data, which is, uh, which is quite good quality data. But if you are wearing the sensors and let's say you're going for a run or walk, um, do your daily chores, right? Then the quality of data is really not that great. And, um, and you might need to do significant filtering of the data to remove those noises. So you have lots of noise, like motion artifacts, muscle noise, etc. So that is a challenge. So I have another group of students working on the problem to address this using multi-sensor, multi-model data fusion. Uh, now, to to uh, to answer your question, so uh, noise is uh, a really a really a challenge in wearable health monitoring. I mean, nobody really have the magic wand or something to fix every noise. So what we can do is we can either apply strong filtering techniques or the other approach being what we do currently is use a multi-model, multi-sensor data fusion where instead of using just one sensor, you collect data from maybe five different sensors and, and fuse them um, uh, in the hope that at least one of them is going to be good at, at, at once. So your hope is not all sensors are not giving bad data at once. If at least one sensor is giving good data, and then you can fuse those signals and get a better measurement. So it's it's similar to what you use in all those aircraft. So if you, if you know about aircraft, you have 10 different sensors for one measurement, and all of them are counted and compared against each other. So something similar to that. So that is the first question. And the second question, on wearable ECG sensors, plug and play type may produce noise due to input power. Uh, how to avoid noise that crosstalks with ECG data? So are you ref what kind of uh, input power are you referring to? Are you referring to the power line noise? If you're referring to the power line noise, I think uh, if you have seen the slide, in uh, in my presentation, so we use some kind of um, uh, sixty hertz noise notch filter. So your power your power supply noise is usually fifty hertz or sixty hertz, depending on where you collect the data. And if you are in India, your power power frequency is fifty hertz, right? So you'll have fifty hertz noise. So this data is originally collected from the U.S. hospital, so that's why we use a sixty hertz. Now. Usually, power line noise is significant if you are connected to a power supply, right? Uh, these IoT sensors are not really connected to a power supply. It's a battery-operated device, okay? And so the power line noises are not that significant, to be honest. But, uh, but these devices, although are not really connected to the power supply, but you can have some kind of electromagnetic interference where you still see a 50 hertz. Um, uh, noise. Uh, we, we have tested this kind of data before and we are still seeing this power line noise. Uh, but what I'm saying is it's not very significant. You can easily remove with the noise filter. Uh, let me take a look at the question again. How to avoid the noise that cross talks with the ECG data? So the power line noise can be removed with the simple noise filter. The good thing about power line noise, it's, it's uh, the frequency is fixed. So you can easily uh, remove the noise. The problem, the noise which really cause problem is those uh, where you, you don't know the characteristics really well, which is motion artifacts. So it could be the, the it's basically non-stationary noise, right? So you could have a low frequency noise or a very high frequency noise if, you, if the subject jumps or moves, makes a sudden move. 
So you don't know exactly the characteristics of that noise. That is more problematic noise. And uh, as I said, you can, again, still go back to the fusion approach to address this, uh, where you fuse the data from multiple sensors, or you can use different sorts of stronger filters uh, to address this. Yeah, that's, that's my comment. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deepu. Uh, uh, of your wonderful talk. Yeah, just one, one question. Uh, yeah. For this, uh, tra you are used to around this um, standard 48 recordings for training this algorithms. So in that, uh, how much was abnormal data and how much was normal data? Oh, so the FISANET database have something like 90% is normal and the remaining 10% is abnormal. So that's why we use the data augmentation approach called SMOD. So it's a synthetic minority oversampling technique where you where you create some sort of synthetic minority data just for the training purpose. Yeah. So 90-10 was, I think, the approximate uh, distribution. So what sort of uh, abnormalities were included? Any anything they have given on that? Oh yeah. So they have they have labels for uh, all the abnormal types. So you have like hundreds of types of arrhythmia out of which they classify all these hundred types into five major classes. So five or six major classes. So uh, I think if you've seen those, some of those slides where, let me share it again then. Some of those slides where I have mentioned N, R, L, V, S. So these are different classes. N is the only normal class. All the other class, R, L, V, et cetera, are abnormal classes. Yeah, so for example, here you can see, the RBB is a class called right bundle branch block. So um, they have defined these classes or, or grouped these classes into five major class groups, which is what we use. But in reality, there are hundreds of different uh, small, small classes uh, for epidemics. Yeah, does, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, for the nice talk. Actually, uh, to be very frank with you, though I understood the overall what you are trying to convey because of my limitation, because of the background, uh, I'm not able to understand fully. But one quick layman question. Why do we, first of all, resample from 360 to 250 hertz and what are its advantages? And what do you mean by overfit? Right. So the, the, the 360, to 250 hertz sampling is not a significant issue um, in this work. So the reason 360 hertz is out, the, uh, the sampling is done is uh, the data available from the public domain with all the labels is at 360 hertz. Okay. So, uh, but most of the actual sensors work in multiples of typically in 100 hertz or 250 hertz uh, or even 500 hertz. 500 hertz is rare. 250, 200 hertz is the typical number. Now, um, most of the existing work don't actually implement their model in a hardware setup. So they don't have to deal with what, what are the available hardware um, sampling rate in, in, that you can interface with. So they just do the model in MATLAB or Python and just submit their uh, work. Since we actually have to implement and test it and demonstrate it as part of this work, we need to get it to work with a practical number, practical sampling rate, which is uh, available from all the sensor front end chips. And therefore we resample it. So that's not a big issue, but, but uh, what, what I was trying to uh, convey is that uh, we, we did do the down sampling, resampling, and in the process, and in the process, we lose some accuracy. So if you have a higher sampling rate, of course, you have a lot more information. And then you can uh, probably get a slightly better uh, accuracy number. If you have lower number of samples per second, less number of samples per second, you're dealing with less data and less information. Probably the accuracy of the predictions are also lower. So what I was trying to convey is we, we actually dealt with a real life scenario, but most of the other work in the literature or um, working with some slightly imaginary situation. So that's what I'm trying to convey. Now, regarding overfitting. Um, overfitting is a, a term used to convey the idea that you develop a model and that model works 
only on a specific set of uh, data. Okay, so so if you give that specific any data point from that specific set of data, you get a correct classification uh, output. Uh, but if you give any other data which is not included in that data set, your model really doesn't work well. I think in the the context I was saying is uh, with the multi the, uh, the imbalance class classification. So if you have a model which is trained using an imbalanced data set where 99% of all data is, let's say, normal, and 1% of all data is type abnormal. And then if the classifier only focuses on that normal data, and, and even if there is no classification, if it just class says all the data is normal, it still have a 99% accuracy by definition. Um, so that is what we were trying to avoid. Um, by making the model train on uh, different types of data, even synthetic data, so that the model doesn't uh, try to predict the data, predict the classific classification output just based on this data. And if we, if we give other type of data, the model will still work. Uh, if you give, well, in the case of an overfitted model, if you give a uh, data outside this data set, it will not work. So that's it. Hope, hope I can. Yeah, uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deepu, for a wonderful talk on modeling of variable IoT sensors. And it's a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, the next session uh, is a oral presentation will be take over by uh, Dr. Abhishek. Good evening, everybody. So we have uh, oral presentations now. Uh, first of, uh, first speaker is uh, OP code uh, OP01. May I request uh, uh, Dr. Solanki to start his presentation, please? Yeah, thank you, Doc. Can I start? I'm yes. audible? Yeah. OK. Thank you, Abhishek, for uh, a kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, Thank uh, organizer for giving me a chance to speak on this platform and congratulate also for uh, hosting such a wonderful event at uh, Symmetry Shoot. Uh, I know I have a limited time, so without uh, wasting my time, I will just directly go to my talk. And uh, I'm Dr. Vandalsi Solanki, and I'm presenting my talk on uh, just a minute. And I'm presenting my talk on. Uh, uh, probing of electronic and protonic conduction uh, with oscillator response from porous SNO2 based uh, humidity sensor. Okay, so this is how I am going to present my talk today. So I will start with introduction. We all know about the sen basic of sensing and everything. So I will not waste more time there. Uh, then I will little bit discuss about this, how we have uh, synthesized the mesoporous uh, tin oxide structure and uh, followed by the device fabrication. Also, how we have uh, probed the electronic and protonic conduction and the crossover and also with the uh, uh, oscillatory response. And finally, I will conclude my uh, talk. So this is about the uh, porous materials. As we all know that they are superior as compared to many, uh, compared to their bulk counterpart because of their specific surface area, large pore value, volume, and tunable pore size. And we know that if we tune, tune this parameter, we can have other further enhanced properties which can be utilized for uh, different applications. And uh, this is about how we can uh, categorize the uh, porous structure according to IUPAC standard. So if we have uh, structures, pore size smaller than two nanometer, we can say it's a microporous structure. And if it is higher than 15 nanometer, it, it is a microporous. And if it is in between, then we can say it's a microporous structure. Uh, first question we have always come to our mind why we are interested in, interesting in a, a humidity sensor. So we know that uh, humidity sensing play a vital role in many technological applications. And uh, it's allowed the host for uh, many value added services like uh, cold storage, which we are using for uh, storing the stuffs for longer, longer time. Uh, it also allows to optimize the uh, comfort at the home and also at the offices. Uh, offices. It also allows us to um, uh, measure the moisture content in the air and the soil so that uh, it, we can say it is uh, also useful in the agricultural field. 
not only this uh, not only this but it is also useful for uh, food processing medical and health monitoring also fuel and aerospace area uh, field uh, this is about uh, how we have synthesized the porous structure so we develop this sequential elemental dlon technique and what we are doing in the process of synthesis we start with the salts which actually contains the different elements like tin zinc copper chlorine oxygen and we mix them together at a room temperature condition and allow for the hydrothermal reaction for 180 degrees centigrade uh, and after end product of the hydro hydrothermal reaction is what we are getting is some precipitates which are cubical in structure and uh, they are light green in color uh, when they are subjected to some higher temperature say 100 degree where we know that the moisture component from contents go out from the from the sample and uh, we the structure physical structure of the uh, precipitates is cubic and uh, we have all the uh, all the elements we have started with and when we increase the temperature to 250 degree centigrade what we have seen that the zinc uh, zinc are uh, getting out from the sample and uh, with, uh, which can be uh, seen from the index data with the reduced intensity of the zinc and when zinc is knocking out from the material it is forming the uh, structure, physical structure of the material and when it further uh, we are increasing the temperature to 450 degree further the chlorine atoms are going out from the sample which can be confirmed from the TGA data and also with the EDX data which indicates the is, uh, intensity of chlorine is just a minute. The intensity of chlorine has reduced a lot which confirm that the chlorine has uh, knocked out from the sample uh, and which further deform the, uh, deform the structure. At the end, when we are uh, raising the temperature to 900 degrees centigrade, what we have seen is that uh, oh, copper also is going out from the sample and we are uh, only with the uh, uh, tin and oxygen in the sample with the uh, nicely defined core in the structure. So what is happening basically when these whole atoms are, are uh, going out from the material, they are, create, they are creating the channel inside and on the way they are because of high energy, uh, they are uh, hammering, hammering the pores inside and uh, create the pore, pore uh, inside the material. So th uh, this is a just zoom view of the structure where, which shows that uh, structure we have a uh, scaffold structure which is defining some pores inside. Uh, we uh, characterize with the XRD to prove the, whether the structure is uh, only tin oxide or we have some other compounds also and it is showing that we have only uh, tin oxide at the end. We also measure the size of the pore and the structure which are defining the pore. So size of the nanostructure is around uh, 90 to 95 and the pore is around 40 to 45. So which shows that which can so we can say that it's a mesoporous in nature. Uh, in the case of device fabrication, we took just small chunk of the powder which we synthesize and uh, we just simply silver paste it on the both end just with a neck eye. And uh, uh, this is how our mobile camera see the device we have fabricated. So here we have uh, the silver paste both the end and here we have a small chunk of the piece of a, a porous tin oxide. And uh, during the sensing what we are doing is basically we are passing this dryer through the water which when which come out when it come out uh, from the water it get moist and when we are mixing with moist water uh, vapors with dryer just varying the uh, amount of air are passing through uh, we can uh, basically change the uh, uh, required uh, humidity, relative humidity in the uh, test chamber. And uh, this is the SEM image of the device we have fabricated and it shows that uh, uh, whatever chunk we have used, you know, it has porous structure. So uh, when we are subjecting this uh, uh, sensor to a humidity uh, from around 31% from 2%, it shows uh, around two-fold uh, uh, change of uh, current enhancement and uh, this response is uh, reversible. And we also uh, tested this uh, sensor for uh, different uh, humidity and uh, this is how the current is varying and we, we can see that from after 70% of RH, the current is drastically increased. I will discuss this thing later. Uh, but for uh, any sensor, it is important that uh, that sensor must be reproducible. So uh, to check that one, we have subjected the sensor to fully atmosphere which is nothing but uh, relative humidity higher than nine, around 99 percent or if you can say higher so uh, the, and when uh, when we are subjecting this one we have seen small some noise initially i thought it is a noise plus uh, 
every time i am seeing this noise so i thought this is uh, this should be some data which, uh, which is nothing but uh, some periodic oscillation which uh, i have mentioned in the title of the talk and uh, in fully humid atmosphere the response what we have seen is around 350 times which is uh, much higher or comparable comparable to many uh, reported literatures so what happening actually when we are increasing the humidity relative humidity from the 2% to 70 and uh, higher so we fitted this data this data with the friendly uh, adsorption isotherm which uh, actually relate the sensitivity the uh, uh, concentration of the analyzed molecules so in the in the range of 0 to 70% we have very uh, sub linear response with the value of alpha around 0.65 and at 70% uh, after 70% the alpha goes to 11.66 which shows that uh, there is a crossover from uh, sub linear to a super linear response and we uh, know that in in all sensor which are based on n type of semiconductors uh, we have a uh, uh, pre uh, adsorbed oxygen species on the surface and whenever we are exposing with the reducing gases the oxygen species are getting replaced by the analyte molecule which gives the electron to the system which find, which gives the electronic conduction so what is happening here is basically in the beginning we have this type of uh, sno2 structure on the surface with the pre oxygen uh, adsorb on the on the surface surface element sorry sensing element so whenever we are exposing with the water molecule the so water molecule are basically replacing the oxygen and increase the uh, uh, electronic conduction and uh, and the zero to seventy percent is actually a low humid region so we have less number of uh, water molecule compared to higher humidity region which is basically higher than seventy percent so in low humid humid region the less number of oxygen species are getting uh, replaced by the water molecule which actually create the first chemisorb and uh, sorry chemisorb and first species of water layer uh, in which uh, actually H plus ions cannot move and the conductivity is very small and it is uh, just uh, limited to electronic one and higher whenever we are increasing to higher uh, more number of water layer uh, more molecule water layer are formed which uh, allow the H plus to move freely and uh, the conduction go uh, change from electron to protonic one this is just uh, uh, to check the uh, how the sensor is responding responding when we are changing one percent orange and uh, uh, this is about uh, long term stability data we have exposed the sensor for in fully humid atmosphere for 15 hour and we have also recorded the response before and after and it is uh, we can say that it is a uh, uh, fully stable and also reproducible also and this is what about the oscillatory response so during the oscillatory response we, we carefully observe when we are changing uh, the humidity it is not abruptly changing from zero to fully humid but it is slowly varying so we have seen that at 70 percent uh, 70 the oscillations are starting and up to 90 percent the oscillations are stopped so this is nothing but when we are uh, we uh, zoomed it we can see that uh, the electronic and protonic one are not uh, overlapping with each other and this is uh, coming because of uh, uh, competitive uh, competition between the uh, oxygen species and water molecule so whenever oxygen mo molecule win the win the game then uh, it, uh, the conduction is uh, dominant by the electronic one and whenever uh, water molecule win the base then it will give you a protonic conduction so with simple adsorption that uh, at 70 percent we have same probability of adsorption of water molecule and the oxygen thesis we tried to model this one uh, so first we converted this uh, current versus the uh, time data and the sensitivity and we are assuming that whenever oxygen is uh, uh, adsorbing on the surface, uh, surface uh, we have a uh, electronic conduction, and whenever a uh, water molecule it, it's getting adsorbed, we have protonic conduction with uh, probability V W. So definitely, uh, oxygen uh, adsorption will have one minus V W. And whenever we are creating this with uh, R S data, so we have uh, this very nice uh, distribution, uh, very nice oscillatory response uh, between electronic to protonic one. And uh, in summary. Uh, we have synthesized SNO2 with uh, sequentially limited dual alloying. In fully humid atmosphere, we have a uh, 350 time uh, current enhancement. Uh, we have uh, seen the oscillatory response and the conduction crossover, and the sensor is highly stable, durable, and reproducible. And uh, thanks to Professor Nanda and to Pani sir. Thank you for your kind attention. Sir. I hope Thank I have uh, finished in a 
in a time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Anraj. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, a couple of quick questions can be taken. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Kumar sir and Muli sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a question to you. Please, sir. Uh, this uh, <coughs> absorption, when you say one, firstly, it is absorption of uh, water vapor. Mm -hmm. And there's other case. You equated them on one particular instance. Yes, they sir. said equal, fifty hmm. percent of each kind of thing. Yeah. How can you make sure that is actually the case? I mean, it's an assumption. So this is actually uh, we we are taking we have actually monitored the uh, this the relative humidity during uh, this sensing experiment. Oh. Okay. Okay, so it is not uh, abruptly changing, but it is uh, as I have shown that it is passing through the water. So definitely, the increase of the humidity is very slow. It is okay. so sense our sensor is saying all the humidity like to one, two, four, five, ten, fifteen, everything. So we monitor this real time and see that around seventy, we the oscillation starts starting, and between eighty-five to ninety, it is the oscillations are stopping. So and, RH uh, monitoring, you are doing that. Okay. Yeah, we are monitoring real time RH. Okay. And this was the first uh, experimental uh, observation uh, about this oscillatory response uh, as per our knowledge base. Yeah, and this uh, curve, the shift in the curve, the slope, mm -hmm. is uh, manif the manifestation of that. Is that what you feel? Uh, which one, sir? You see the slope of the curve is changing in, the, in this picture. Okay, here? That is, it is abruptly jumping to another slope, isn't it? Here, uh, you mean uh, in oscillatory response? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah th this is because uh, initially uh, till seventy percent we have just uh, very less number of uh, water molecules, so uh, protonic conduction will not be there. Okay. But whenever water molecules are coming and uh, uh, they start winning the game, uh, game, so basically we have we abruptly change in the uh, current because of the protonic conduction. And if you see carefully, these two lines are not actually matching at okay. here this place. Surely, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Vandraj, um, actually, I can understand the protonic conduction. Can mm -hmm. you tell me from where the electrons are coming? Electron in the case of uh, electronic part? Huh. Okay, this is basically uh, a normal sen sensing. So, in uh, we are mostly in N type uh, uh, semiconductor when we are using as a sensing element. So we have a pre adsorbed oxygen species, which are basically O2 minus. And when we expose with the analyte molecules, the oxygen species are being replaced by uh, with the analyte molecule. So basically, which we initially we have double bonded. Now we it make a single bond and deliver one electron to the system. So, so that there, is, therefore, does it have any relation to the band gap? Band gap. Uh, Band gap, you can say that uh, it's uh, again change with the uh, applied voltage. So if if it is uh, relating with the band gap, then uh, definitely we have to apply minimum voltage. I, I don't think it is uh, because of that. Okay, Sorry, I think I I think uh, you can shed some light for me if possible. No, no. Basically, I think the electrons in the conduction band are involved in your con electron conduction. Right? Huh, that is true. Yeah, that is true. So therefore, band gap should play a significant role in your electronic conduction. Okay. Yeah. Please have a look at it. Sure. All the best. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We can see a couple of questions in the chat box. So may I request the presenter to answer those questions in the chat box itself? And uh, respond. Response time is a bit uh, larger because uh, the sense, uh, the humidity is. Uh, uh, varying very slowly, so the response time is around 200 uh, plus uh, second, but recovery time is very fast, is, it is around 5 to 10 seconds only. Yeah, I can see. Uh, regeneration of the SNO2 is basically because of the remove, uh, means desorption of the water molecules. Okay, thank you, Vanraj. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. May, uh, before yeah, we start you. for the next uh, speaker, a general uh, uh, announcement that I request all the oral presenter to uh, limit their talk for seven minutes and keep three minutes for question and answer discussion.
So may I request now Mr. Tijin Thomas to start his or her, her talk, please. Thank you so much, Thomas. Doctor. Yeah. Yes. Is my skin visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Hello, all. Nice. Okay. Can I start? Yeah, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, hello, all. A warm good good evening. I am Tijin Thomas, and I am going to present my work, which is entitled "Molybdenum Carbide Maxine Sensors <clears throat> for the Room Temperature Carbon Dioxide Detection." My presentation includes briefly the introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion, and finally the conclusions. Coming to the term MXINs, MXINs are 2D layered materials derived from transition metal carbides, nitrides, or carbonitrides. They are generally derived from a parent max phase. They have a general formula Mn plus 1 AXN, where M can be an early transition metal, A can be a group 3 or group 4 element, X can be carbon or nitrogen, and N can take the values 1, 2, or 3. MXINs are generally formed by etching out the A layer, selectively etching out by the means of acid and the exfoliation. And they have the general formula Mn plus 1 X and Tx. And Tx is a can be any functional group that can be fluorine, hydroxyl group, or oxygen. And coming to the properties of MXINs, they can act as metallic or semiconducting depending upon the functional group attached to the stoichiometry. Because of that, they have interesting mechanical, electrical, magnetic, and electrochemical characteristics due to this their tunable chemistry. Because of their two-dimensional morphology and layered structures, they can easily form nanocomposite with other materials. Also, they exhibit high conductivity and outstanding electrochemical activity. Because of that, they are primarily used in energy storage as high efficiency electrodes, that is in <clears throat> energy storage, uh, lithium sulfur batteries, sodium ion batteries, and supercapacitors. But recently, they have shown some interesting gas sensing properties with higher sensitivity towards various gases, but the area is still unexplored, least explored. So we are going to discuss about the synthesis of molybdenum carbide amoxines on various substrates for the detection of carbon dioxide. For that, we prepared molybdenum carbide amoxine from molybdenum indium carbide non-max phase uh, by the means of solid state reaction. And uh, we etched the max phase by the means of UV assisted phosphoric acid and formed layered amoxines. These layered amoxines are deposited on various substrate materials that is porous silicon crystalline, silicon and glass. And we have studied the gas sensing properties of these fabricated sensors. We have done the exotic characterization to confirm the formation of the MOS 2CTX amoxines. And we have seen that indium is selectively etched out from the max phase forming the perfect amoxines. To confirm this, we have done the XPS characterization. And the, in the XPS characterization also, we confirm that indium is selectively etched out from the stoichiometry of the uh, max phase and forming the perfect amoxines. These are the high resolution images of the uh, amoxines and max phase. And there is an evidence of the formation of oxygen functionalization. For confirming it, we have done EDS mapping. And in the EDS mapping, we found that there is an presence of oxygen, which is an evidence of the oxygen functionalization on the surface of the amoxine. These are the FISM images of the porous silicon substrate and the deposition of amoxine on the porous silicon. And we can see in the figure F that there is a uniform deposition of the layered amoxine inside the pores. Coming to the gas sensing properties, we have done the gas sensing uh, carbon dioxide detection by varying the concentration of the carbon dioxide and the uh, uh, working temperature. We observed that the sensor fabricated on porous silicon exhibited almost a linear increase in the sensitivity with the increase in the uh, concentration and the uh, working temperature. Whereas in the case of glass and uh, crystalline silicon, it was not up to the mark. And uh, in the case of glass, it decreases after 200 degrees Celsius. That is the saturation of the sensor is reached after 200. Then we have calculated the response and recovery times for these fabricated sensors. And we observed that the lowest sensing response and recovery times were observed at room temperature as 30 and 46, uh, 45 seconds 
for a 50 ppm of carbon dioxide I and mean, it is what it was for the porous silicon gas sensor the long term stability of the sensor was studied by measuring the gas sensing responses at 60 degrees celsius for 150 ppm of carbon dioxide for a period of 65 days and it was observed that only less than one percentage of the sensing response was decreasing after 65 days of stable operations the repeatability of the sensor was studied by doing the dynamic response by varying the uh, working temperature and the uh, concentration of the carbon dioxide and it was observed that it was almost highly repeatable with stable performance after few cycles of operation in all the cases. Coming to the sensing mechanism, the sen mechanism involved can be explained due to the semiconducting nature of the uh, fabricated uh, sensor because of the semiconducting nature of the MO2C TX. This can be due to the semiconducting behavior of MO2C due to the oxygen functionalization on the surface. We observed a positive change in the resistance with the uh, exposure of carbon dioxide to the surface of the material. So there was a decrease in the charge uh, carriers that is electrons on the surface due to the uh, reaction of carbon dioxide. That this is like the oxygen species react with the carbon dioxide forming a metastable CO3 to minus ions with the expense of thermal energy. This causing an electron scarcity on the surface of the sensor during the exposure of the gas. And the uh, overall reaction can be summarized uh, uh, as the equation shown in the uh, uh, screen. And coming to the conclusions, we fabricated molybdenum carbide a maxine sensor supported on different substrate materials that is glass, crystalline silicon and porous silicon. And uh, the working temperature was varied from 32 to 50 degrees Celsius and the carbon dioxide concentration from 50 to 150. The sensor on porous silicon and glass exhibited excellent room temperature sensing response with a fast response and recovery under 50 ppm of carbon dioxide. The highest response was observed for a porous silicon sensor working at 250 degrees Celsius for 150 ppm, which was 25 percentage. And uh, fast response and recovery times for this porous silicon sensor was 30 and 45 seconds at room temperature and uh, 50 ppm of carbon dioxide. And these are the references which I use for this study. And finally, thank you. And you, you can ask any questions. You, yeah. you are welcome. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Where, wherever there is uh, carbon dioxide emission or there's a carbon dioxide for sensing, normally yes, there's a temperature involved. So yes, in, in exit gas or something like that. So yes. what up to what temperature you think these sensors will work? You are shown uh, 250, is it? Yes, sir. After two, after two yeah, after 250, we were observing a lot of noises in the study. So we that uh, we hope that after 250, the saturation is reaching for our case. In our case, yeah, yeah. So for a, for example, an exhaust gas or something like that, exhaust yes. of. Uh, automobile or something like that, you want to put a sensor. Yes, sir. Um, you think it'll work? Uh, in, the, in the present case, I don't think because uh, uh, these are only limited for the range between 30 to 250. So in the exhaust, the temperature may be above 250. So yes. that case, it, it may not fit okay. for the scenario. So what, what remedies you can, what can you do if you want to go to higher temperatures? you have any ideas? Uh, at present, we don't have any idea, but uh, we are working on the higher temperature also. If we, be, if we substitute this substrate material with some other uh, substrate material, which can withstand this much temperature, maybe there is a probability that we can work okay. in the higher. It, it's a practical requirement to have higher sensor. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you show the next slide, please? Uh, sorry, same slide, same slide. Your uh, sensor's performance improves after 40 days. Any reason yes. for that? Uh, I don't know really because maybe the humidity have some effect on that. So that we are now studying on the humidity effect of the sensor also by varying the humidity conditions. So you I have, think- You have yes, to look at that, okay? Yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir, sure. And uh, uh, your end product is a carbonate. Yes. Is it going yes. to coat your sensor surface and uh, create some interference while sensing? No, sir. 
after uh, uh, as soon as we stop the gas flow the sensor return to its final state uh, so what is the fate of that carbonate then how does it leave the system uh, when the um, flow is stopped uh, uh, the, we are applying some temperatures uh, so because of that oh. this uh, becoming uh, going this is a uh, meta stable state so it is a temporary state so after the stopping of the gas it uh, goes back to this uh, uh, carbon dioxide state once uh, the flow is stopped okay all the best huh? good luck thank you sir thank you mr thomas you, next sir. speaker uh, dr tirumalai rajanes uh, his op code is op3 Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Trimalai Rajan S to start his uh, presentation, please. Can I start my presentation? Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me opportunities to present my work. Um, uh, title of my presentation. I'm before going to my title. Uh, myself, Dr. S. Thirumalai Rajan, working as TBD Ramalinga Samiri and faculty fellow, Department of Nano Science and Technology, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, Coimbatore. Uh, title of my. Can you make us? Can you speak a bit louder? I can. You audible, but little, little, little louder will be useful. Okay, sir. Okay, If you okay. Can. okay. Title of my presentation: Design and efficient SCRS active substrate of silver uh, titanium oxide nanostructure for excellent ultra sensitivity reduction of pesticide on the surface of fruits. Uh, this is the overall my presentation. Uh, why need the reduction of pesticide residues and the importance of SCRS analysis? Objective of the my presentation. Finally, summary and the significant achievement of my work. Is why we need the reduction of pesticide residues. Uh, because the pesticide residues are containing highly toxic from the fruits and vegetable not only for india the world wide endangering problem in the human health at uh, particularly on brain and nervous system even at very low concentration uh, many survey conducted by various food safety institution indicate 60 to 70 percentage of vegetables and fruits production are contaminated with pesticide residues uh, like that argon and phosphorus argon and chlorine pythrite and carbamate India is second ranking in the production of fruits and vegetable after China with 14.6 percentage of total world production. Other side, India is ranked fourth place through the production of agrochemical and fertilizer in the world. This in the right side, right side uh, image represented that chemical on the flood. How much pesticide residues in present of the our fruits and vegetables? The 40 percentage are argon and chlorine pesticide, and 30 percentage are argon and phosphate. Five percentage of pesticide, and 10 percentage of uh, synthetic pesticide. Right, sir. Uh, so uh, nowadays, a new class of uh, pesticide like the neonic side also used. Uh, so what happened? Uh, impact of these uh, our uh, people's human uh, in child uh, maybe eating the pesticide residues, fruits and vegetable day by day, the loss of weight and the mid age and the old age people maybe the change of the metabolism. So we need the ultra sensitive detection of pesticide residues on surface of fruits is a very crucial problem. That's why we take this uh, project. Uh, this is why you need for the SCRS analysis because currently many techniques have detection of the uh, pesticides residues like the GCMS, HPLC, and uh, electrochemical oxidation. Uh, but that uh, technique is only for the quantity analysis. Some this uh, detection of uh, uh, quality. But in the, in the technique, we can an achievement for the single molecule detection. Also, this uh, enhancement factor is we can achieve for the hot spot the nanostructure material for 10 power 6 to 10 power 11. Also, the absorption coefficient of the probe is very high. This is the historical generation, the development of the Raman spectroscopy. This Raman spectroscopy discovered for our great Indian scientist for the C. V. Raman. Uh, this actually the surface enhancing Raman spectroscopy discovered in 1977, but this uh, using the applicable in 1997. Right now, many applications like the chemical identification and physical identification for crystallinity space and uh, trace analysis for using for the phase say residues and biological to detection of T N U and the medicine for the glucose in vitro. This is the uh, 
surface enhancing Raman spectroscopy mechanism. Two parameters are very important in this uh, surface enhancing Raman spectroscopy. One for the chemical enhancement and other one for electromagnetic enhancement. This, we, we will discuss in the later slide that this is the uh, how to infect of this uh, Raman spectroscopy in our case side uh, combined with our preparation materials. This is the overall objective of my presentation. Uh, what is the proposed to control the uh, size and the different safe of this silver titanium nanostructure material for simple method uh, to deduction of uh, chlorofluorine force on the surface of uh, crepes and tomato. This is the schematic illustration of synthesis process of this uh, our different safe of the nanostructure material. Uh, the synthesis part the four parameters very important one for nucleation, aggregation, and recrystallization process, and finally. For the, so using the surfactant. Surfactant is the most important role of the make the different shape of the nanostructure. Uh, this is a confirmation to the surface morphology of uh, uh, our preparation material, our silver top titanic microsphere, combine of the different nanostructure, for example, A and B for the nano plate and C for nano rod, C and D for nano rods. This corresponding TEM analysis, we have find out for the TEM analysis in nano rod that uh, average 30 nanometer and the nano plate is 50 to 60 nanometers. Again, the confirmation of chemical state and uh, elemental state of the chemical composition and element state of the as prepared of nanostructure material because the homogeneity is very important. Here, the survey spectrum of the XPX, the confirmation of silver, uh, titanium, oxygen only the present. Uh, so once we confirmation shape, size and the composition, we move to the application part like the uh, deduction, deduction of SA residues in fruits. This is the, the application of our sensing substrate. Uh, this is the paste peel of technology to detection of uh, surface of fruits and vegetables like grapes and tomato, uh, the detection of uh, chlorophyll pesticides. This is a, a surface spectrum of chlorophyll and grapes and the tomato. The, this inter, the concentration also increase the increase in the intensity. That is the, co the corresponding correlation coefficient for 0 0.9983 in the case of uh, crepes, the deduction limit 2 nanogram uh, for centimeter square. This is the 5 nanogram centimeter square for tomato. This is the uh, great achievement compared to the reported value. And also we are checking for the reproducibility for different time. This is the, also a good linearity of this work. This is the actually charge transplant mechanism. What happened inside of our preparation material to the analytical of pesticides. These are two parameters already I told in the SARS sensing um, image. The, here also applicable first one for the electromagnetic enhancement between the our silver to uh, titanium axer and titanium axer to silver that is called the toner absorber bridge that is called the hot spot image also this uh, chemical enhancement effect between the, our preparation material to our analytical to the enhancement in the both of to increasing the ultra sensitivity level like the 2 nanogram for uh, uh, crepes and 5 nanogram for uh, tomato Finally, the conclusion of our talk, that we have achieved the novel safe and control size of silver top titanium hybrid nanostructure sample for surfactant and wet chemical route. Once optimized the confirmation of characterization analysis, do make the fabrication of SCRS a substrate to the simple drop plate technique and the confirmation to the nano rod, nano plate is average size 70 to 40 nanometer. The deduction range for 10 power minus 2 to 10 power minus 9 more with the deduction limit 2 nanogram for, for centimeter cube for crepes and 5 nanogram for tomato. Throw the correlation coefficient for 0 0.9983 and 996, 0 0.9966. Uh, interestingly, this uh, sensor is uh, most excellent ultra sensitivity and reusability for real time sample. It is promised to for the on site detection of SA residues in near future because this work is only laboratory work. We move to the next level to make the commercial available fruits and vegetables will be tested uh, our preparation device. Finally, thanks to our government of India. DBD is to provide the fund and also our TNV members and support each and every to support this work. Thank you, sir. Excellent, sir. Uh, you showed some sensitivity values in your last uh, la last but one view graph. Uh, when you make commercially these uh, devices, what sensitivity will you achieve? Will it drop a will drop a bit? I'm talking on ma mass manufacturing of this because. The requirement of these uh, sensors exist in the country where we have so much agricultural products and uh, 
uh, you know you all toxins have to be detected yes, sir yes, sir here one uh, one problem to so how much using the pesticide in farmers and other people sir so that's a very uh, great challenge to to find out that so that's why yes. we have, yeah that's why we have find out the if you use some people i am asking the i i'm going to asking directly in farmer how much are you using this your uh, pesticide they will not tell you but that that he did not telling anything yet. but yes. uh, um, my point of view um, i make the my device i checking that the time the, you you can use this website for this much level if you go into the ultra sensitive like the 2 nanogram is a very small amount but if, that day if, if you if that website present our fruits like grapes or uh, uh, tomato if eating every day that is called for slow poison like you have eating everyone take the fruits and uh, vegetables okay. for every day agreed my point is when you make finally make a sensor which will which you give to some shopkeeper and he keeps checking yes, when sir, he buys the next plan next plan i know but what sensitivity will you will you achieve at that point when you fabricate that's from asking but that is this is the ulti, uh, ultimate level sir because the previously for uh, 500 nanograms and 1000 uh, 1 microgram that that yeah, level yeah. sir let so me frame the to... let me frame the question a little differently for the for the purposes of uh, citizens what kind of toxicity levels will we should be able to measure already the food and corporation our indian government released every year this, yes. this type of pesticide is using for this kind of fruits and vegetable we can wash uh, four type of washing like running wash salt water term turmeric waters at out of these three kind of washing some pesticide present of these uh, sure. fruits and vegetable that pesticide we can find out and uh, detect for the limit okay thank you thank you please go to slide number 7 whether the fourth bullet the values you have reported are better than what is available in the literature yeah. sir that is the 500 nanogram and some some people is reported for 1 microgram okay so you have to highlight that yes sir yes. Yes, sir we can we plan to move the pattern work this work pattern sir this work okay sir. then uh, what is the importance of uh, nano rods in your sensing mechanism sir But this is the most helpful compared to the among the two structure. Uh, I think is a nano rod is the achievement this result. But nano plate is little more like five nanogram. This is for eight nanograms. This is one dimensional nano structure. So more most surface area like compared to nano. No, that you, the, that you have not mentioned in your talk. You have not mentioned about the role of morphology in sensing. Uh, yes. Okay. So Please, the short uh, time that's a seven to uh, five okay. to seven minutes. That's why I will shut. i uh, convey okay. for uh, my direction limited sir that's why okay thank you very much thank you all the best thank you sir thank you dr trimula rajan may I invite next speaker mr sai manishankar anupoyu op number 4 to start his uh, talk please thank you sir thank you sir Can I audible? Sir? Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, you can see my screen, sir. Yes. Can you able to see my screen? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Manish Shankar. I'm working as a project associate uh, in uh, Center of Excellence in IoT Sciences. Uh, I'm from CMET Trishu. Today, I'm going to present the study and design of a non-dispersive infrared CO2 gas sensor. and now let's make the sense of a so today my agenda is why co2 monitoring and the science behind what is ndi technology and what is the design prototyping experiment and my analysis and my road map and conclusion so why why co2 monitoring is essential these days why it's important now so actually i'm talking about the, the indoor air quality which depends upon the number of occupants in the inside the building so if the number of occupants in the building or in a confined space or in a flight or a train the co2 concentration around us will increase according to the world health organization who the recommended co2 layers are only from 600 to 800 ppm when this concentration level increases we may start feeling the discomfort fatigue and uh, headache even when it goes to 1500 ppm and more we may start uh, feeling very 
uncomfortable and uh, we move we try to move out this is a uh, one of the software company has analyzed this by when the ppm level crosses 1200 ppm uh, it, the decision making skills will reduce for the employees of the software employees this is the study done by it. okay to briefly understand this our journey our life journey starts from the let's uh, introduce uh, rani she is uh, in a baby incubator our life journey starts from here actually where the co2 concentration will be 1000 ppm inside that incubator closed space and when she grows up she goes to a school and college where she will be surrounded with uh, tens and twenties of people where the co2 levels will be around 1200 ppm and when she grows up she goes to her office using some metro train so these metro stations are crowded these days and the CO2 concentration levels are around 2000 ppm. These all are alarming conditions, which we are not aware. We are actually aware of uh, this uh, cooling and uh, air conditioning, not of CO2. So this is a must and should now, we should concentrate on it. And also the recent studies, uh, and I hope we haven't uh, forgot this uh, pandemic situation and the social distancing we used to do. This is because there is a direct correlation between the human exhale carbon dioxide and virus transmitting aerosols like coronavirus. So it's uh, directly linked to the coronavirus. So the sensing of CO2 is must, and we should have the CO2 sensors wherever the inside, indoor buildings, spaces are available. So just let's uh, jump into the science behind the CO2 gas sensing, the basic science. From last uh, two days, we are observing, we are seeing so many types of uh, CO2 gas, uh, gas sensing technologies which are actually based on uh, nanotechnology, electrochemical technology, and metal oxide semiconductor technology. Now, let me introduce this technology, this non-dispersive infrared spectroscopy, this physics, uh, the basic uh, principle it follows is uh, beer lamp slug. Why we choose this uh, technology is that it having the long lasting, nearly 10 to 15 years. And just we have seen that uh, uh, just my present, uh, past uh, presentation, it can last only for uh, 45 to 60 days, up to 60 days, it may get the, it what give the correct readings. But my sensor, this NDR sensor, it can long last and it, if you can mount and further type. And it has a very good gas selectivity and good repeatability and reproducibility and rarely requires the calibration. So these are the advantages over this uh, electrochemical and the metal oxide it takes. So let's uh, just understand what is this non-dispersive infrared technology. So actually this uh, requires a gold-plated gas chamber, which have which air can in, go in and come out. The atmospheric air, which is installed uh, in a building, let's say. So the, uh, the atmospheric uh, or the, around, the gas, the air around us enters into this gold-plated gas chamber. This gold plated gas chamber consists of infrared lamp and an optical filter. It's a very specific filter, I will explain you, and a photo detector. And actually the gas entering into this uh, gold plated chamber consists of CO2 molecules. When we observe the CO2 molecules have a strong characteristic absorption spectrum of a specific wavelength. Uh, I can say this 4260. You can see these red lines, right? This 4260 nanometer specific infrared wavelength like energy will be absorbed by the CO2 molecules. It's the characteristic of CO2 molecules. It will absorb that energy and convert into vibrational energy. So the remaining rays will fall on this optical filter. That means if the concentration of CO2 molecules is high inside this gold plated chamber, the more specific wavelength of 4 to 6 zero uh, infrared rays will be observed and less it falls on the optical filter. What is the main uh, reason we are using this optical filter is, we want this measurement of only 4 to 6 zero nanometers. For that, this optical filter, what it does means, it will reflect back all other infrared, like two to 10 micrometer, whatever range of infrared, and only allows this four to six zero nanometer to pass through this optical filter and touch to the, touch to this uh, photo detector. And this, uh, the, whatever light falls on this photo detector is converted into an electrical output. 
uh, which can be converted into a concentration PPM. Calibration can be done for it. And uh, let's see my design and prototyping what we have did. And this is a non-dispersive gold-plated sample collecting chamber. This has to be very optimally designed. And we first we designed it a 3D design and we have built in-house prototype, which we can see it's a gold-plated completely. And uh, we can see the bends. And also why it is gold-plated, the main reason is the CO2, the infrared rays coming from this infrared lamp should not be observed by the capsule itself. So the gold is a metal which cannot observe this infrared rays. That is the reason why it is used. And uh, this is my experimental setup, what I have used it. And we have tested all our uh, setup, experimental setup, and uh, we tested the sensor and we got this response curve. And one thing we can observe, when the concentration level is very less, CO2 concentration, for example, in a room, in a conference hall, if the concentration is very less, we can say that if the concentration is less, the absorption will be very less. And the four to six zero specific infrared rays will fall directly on this optical filter and filter out and get on uh, to the photo detector. So the mag, uh, when the concentration is less, the more energy it will be received by the photo detector and the output voltage will be more. When the concentration is uh, more, the uh, absorption will be more and the output voltage will be less. This is the thing. And uh, this is my technical specifications. We can able to see it. And it's a range of four to 5,000 PPM. It's uh, uh, specifically built for indoor air quality. And this is my, my, my conclusion is that, see the present situation we can see Russia, Ukraine war. Here, the thousands of people are hiding completely in the closed and the crowded bunkers, whereas there is no ventilation system. So the present uh, coming years, we can see the countries are fighting together where the bunkers with the clean air is essential. That means we should need this air sensing technology, this gas sensing, uh, CO2 gas sensors in this bunker source. This is one of my opinion for the present scenario. Thank you and thank you for the support of CMET. This was funded, this project is funded by the CMET of uh, under COE project. Thank you. You can ask me any questions. Yeah. You you are uh, making this uh, electrodes with gold plating and things like that. Yes. So you think uh, you will be able to uh, make a unit which is uh, inexpensive or the cost will be very high? Yes, sir. actually uh, we are using. Very... It, yeah. No, no. What is the, the cost board... estimated cost of a yes, unit? Yes, actually this uh, CO two sensors in market available is uh, nearly ten thousand to eight thousand. Uh, it okay. depends upon the accuracy, but we are going to design it for 3000 below 3000 and the gold plating we are using, it will be in the nanometer or micrometer thickness only. It just uh, has to, uh, it's, it's used for just for uh, not to observe that infrared rays, that's it. We just need the layer of thin layer of over the, the capsule. It's not completely made of gold, it's a, just a very thin layer. Of it. What, what is the... What is the technique by which it uh, detects uh, carbon dioxide? That is not yes, clear in your talk. Yes, sir. The CO2 uh, molecules in air will have that uh, strong absorption of uh, the infrared rays. Actually, it will observe the specific infrared rays of uh, 4 to 6 zero nanometer wavelength okay. infrared rays it will observe. And if we can able to differentiate between the total amount of infrared rays we, inject, uh, we emitted, and also how much we uh, it got observed. If we can able to differentiate between these two, that value directly gives a concentration PPM. Okay. How it is proposed to be done, I don't know, but uh, I accept that. Okay, fine. Uh, Mr. Manishankar. Yes, sir. What is the influence of humidity on carbon dioxide detection? Yes, sir. Humidity and when you are doing an experiment with gold coated chamber, you are letting in dry carbon dioxide air. Okay. Yes, sir. But in real environment, you have also water. You see the number of people inside a bunker or crowding near a electric train. Okay. Yes. So, what is the influence of H2O on CO2 and therefore whether it will interfere with your infrared absorption? Please check that and then uh, try to see whether. 
such kind of interferences matter in your detection okay yes sir actually and uh, we are using a layer of uh, um a uh, moisture absorbing layer over that inlet and outlet uh, vents so that it is able to yeah yeah in a, in experiment in lab you may exclude h2o yeah. yes, but sir. in real sensing environment for example in a railway station or in a uh, bunker or in a hospital or in any other place yes, there yes. Are, there is also an additional presence of uh, humidity please check the presence of uh, influence of humidity on co2 sensing and see whether your design is all, all right or needs further improvement all the best thank you okay thank you, thank you mr manishankar next speaker ms navami sunil i request navami sunil uh, to start her presentation please ah, her op code is op05 okay is it visible sir Yeah, it is visible. You may start now. Okay. So a warm welcome to one and all present here. I'm now Miss Nil, and uh, I am a research scholar under the guidance of Dr. P. B. G. in PhD Institute of Advanced Studies. Hello, Naomi. Please uh, hello. come close to the mic. Ah, yes, sir. Volume is very less. Okay, sir. You speak louder. Start, start. Ah, okay, sir. Uh, so today I'm going to deliver a talk on SCRS investigation of salivary biomarkers for oral cancer diagnosis using silver anchored alpha amino to nano rod based uh, SCRS substrates. So thiocyanate it acts as a natural antioxidant in the immune system, and it is introduced in the human body uh, through the intake of uh, vegetables, milk, cheese, etc. And therefore, it can be uh, found in human body fluids, including the saliva, serum, as well as urine. And but uh, many reports have shown that this uh, elevated levels of the th salivary thiocyanate leads to uh, various health issues, including cardiovascular diseases, gastrointestinal disease, respiratory disease, as well as uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. And then uh, this saliva proves to be a, a metabolite of the cyanate, and so the accumulation of which uh, occurs from the tobacco exposure, and uh, therefore it is used as an important biomarker in order to uh, differentiate between the smokers as well as non-smokers. So as we all know, the smokers they are more prone to oral cancer risk uh, since the elevated level of thiocyanate in saliva. Uh, through nitrosation process. So this is here uh, is a graph which shows the salivary thiocyanate levels uh, in healthy individuals as compared to that of the various type of uh, smokers. So in our work, we are utilizing uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy for the detection of uh, thiocyanate in saliva and uh, therefore rapid screening of this uh, thiocyanate levels in saliva uh, is possible and uh, application for uh, oral cancer diagnosis. So our major objective of our work is the SCRS investigation of the salivary thiocyanate using a silver anchored alpha MNO2 uh, nano rod based SCRS substrate and its application for oral cancer diagnosis. Uh, the specific objective includes uh, the synthesis of uh, AG anchored alpha MNO2 nano rods followed by the structural as well as morphological characterization of the material. Then we will go for SCRS detection of the thiocyanate and moving on to a salivary thiocyanate detection using uh, SCRS. And finally, we will study the effect of interference with uh, salivary thiocyanate. So this is the methodology which uh, we have adopted. And we have initially synthesized the alpha MNO2 nano rods using a simple hydrothermal method using uh, potassium permanganate as well as uh, nitric acid. And uh, once the uh, alpha MNO2 nano rods were synthesized, then we attached silver nanoparticles on the surface of this alpha MNO2 nano rods. So this is the this is a temp image, and this is how our material looked like. Um, Please speak louder. Uh, we can see that uh, this silver nano, nano nanoparticles have uniformly attached all over the surface of this alpha MNO2 nanorods. 
and uh, then after the successful synthesis of the material uh, we have uh, characterized we have done the structural as well as morphological characterization using xrd analysis raman ftir etc and uh, the xrd analysis of the uh, mno2 as well as agmno2 were compared with the jcpdms database uh, uh, and uh, it were uh, it, it shows that it was successfully synthesized and uh, similarly we have done the raman as well as ftir analysis and uh, the uh, Uh, all, all the all this were uh, in good agreement with the previous literatures and we have confirmed the synthesis of the material then we move on to the morphological characterization of the material we have taken the sm analysis and uh, we have found out that uh, the uh, nano rods were successfully synthesized and um, it is decorated it is uh, randomly distributed so this is the this image is the shows the temp analysis of the alpha mno2 nano rods and uh, the ag decorated alpha mno2 nano rods so from this temp image it is clear that the silver nano particle got uniformly uh, attached or decorated on the surface of the alpha mno2 nano rods thus it can be used as an efficient uh, the plat uh, pattern corresponding to the uh, mno2 nano rods as well as ag anchored mno2 nano rods uh, telling the polycrystalline nature uh, then in order to prove the uh, formation of uh, silver anchored uh, alpha mno2 we have done the eds analysis and from this we can see that uh, the peak of ag we can see that uh, the successful formation of or successful uh, decoration of this silver nano particles over the surface of uh, Alpha and MnO2 was successfully carried out. Then uh, we moved on to the application part. Here uh, we have uh, first compared the Raman spectra of normal thiocyanate, uh, and then SCRS using our uh, Ag MnO2 as the SCRS substrate. So here we found out that a strong Raman band. Uh, appearing at 2150 is attributed to the cn stretching vibration uh, and then uh, here itself we can compare the enhancement factor and uh, uh, using our uh, scrs substrate uh, there is almost a five times enhancement uh, using our uh, agmno2 as the substrate so uh, then after that uh, we have uh, done the scrs uh, a different concentration of thiocyanate ranging from 10 millimolar to 50 millimolar using uh, agmno2 as the uh, scrs substrate and uh, from this it is it was clear that uh, as the in raman intensity showed enhancement and uh, as the concentration of thiocyanate is increasing the intensity also showed increasing so uh, this can be due to this is due to the higher concentration of silver leading to more pronounced plus Mon excitation effect, uh, which resulting in a uh, efficient excitation of the Raman mods, and uh, therefore uh, higher enhancement is taking place. So this one is the plot plot of peak intensity at two one five zero centimeter inverse as a function of thiocyanate concentration. Next, we moved on to the uh, real time saliva sample analysis. That is the detection of thiocyanate in saliva, real time saliva. So here uh, I have done uh, SCRS uh, using. Spiked the saliva samples, and uh, that means the saliva spiked with different concentration of thiocyanate, ranging from one millimolar to six millimolar. So, uh, as per the literature review, uh, we have found out that in normal healthy individuals, the level of salivary thiocyanate is two uh, millimolar, whereas uh, in smokers it may be as high as six millimolar. So that is why we take. We we took this concentration like uh, from one millimolar to six millimolar in order to differentiate. Uh, so here also we uh, found out that uh, the strong Raman peak at two one five zero is attributed to the CN stretching vibration mode, and uh, the intensity increased with increase in the concentration of uh, thiocyanate as expected. And uh, then after this, uh, we have uh, also studied the effect of different interference uh, with thiocyanate in saliva. So the different interference uh, with, in saliva are acetate, carbonate, chloride, nitrate, as well as sulfate. And so we have studied the effect of all these interference, and the result indicated that the presence of these uh, anions has very little impact on the peak intensity two one zero zero, which can be uh, confirmed using this graph, where we can see that there is no other peaks in this position. So it can be used as a uh, method uh, for. Uh, detection of thiocyanate even with the presence of other interfering anions so this is uh, some of the works which i have, we have done
And summary uh, of the work is, uh, we have successfully synthesized alpha MnO2 nanoroots using a simple hydrothermal process. Then uh, we have uh, synthesized uh, the silver decorated alpha MnO2 nanoroots. Then structural as well as morphological characterization of uh, both MnO2 as well as AG MnO2 nanoroots has been uh, done. Then uh, we have uh, then the SCRS detection of different concentration of thiocyanate ranging from 10 millimolar to 50 millimolar. Uh, then followed by uh, SCRS detection of the real time saliva samples uh, by uh, detection of thiocyanate in saliva using spiked saliva samples in a concentration range of 1 millimolar to 6 millimolar. Then finally, we have also studied the effect of interference uh, with thiocyanate in saliva in order to prove the specificity. So these are the initial results uh, which we have done till now and uh, there are uh, much more pending works in there. So that's all. Thank you for giving this opportunity and thank you. So have you produced a master curve showing the concentration and the detection? This, this set? This one set? Of the thiocyanate or whatever, yeah. Yeah, thiocyanate. You're showing detection, I can understand that. But uh, for a known concentration, ah, yes, sir. what is the signal you are getting? Do you have a master curve you produce? Is that what you showed earlier? I don't know. Uh, this is the peak corresponding to Please, uh, sir, C and stretching. Talk volume. loud. Uh, this is the uh, Peak corresponding to C and stretching vibration, sir. That I, I can understand the vibration part, but if there is a known concentration, if there is an ah, unknown yes, sir, concentration, how will you find out? Yes, sir. That is what we are working on now. These are some of the initial results only, sir. Okay. So uh, many works are pending, sir. So okay. that one we will uh, do it in the later stages, sir. Okay, fine. What is the nature of silver uh, TiO MnO2 interface? Uh, sir, I'm not sure in that, sir. Okay. Why you have taken silver? Uh, Decorate your nano rod. Plasmonic, because of its plasmonic effect, sir. And then what is the role of MnO2? Uh, MnO2 already, there are many reports that showing that the semiconductor noble, uh, noble material composite, metal composite will have a Raman uh, effect, sir. SARS enhancements. Sir. So that is why we have chosen this and uh, uh, nano rods means as uh, Dr. Pirumali Raj said, it is like um, high surface area to volume ratio, sir. So we can use that MNO2, sir. Okay. Have you uh, tried actually the saliva of uh, patients, uh, heavy smokers? People who smoke uh, too uh, many cigarettes, planning. have you tested their saliva using your no. method? No, sir. That also you have to do it. That's our next. Uh, okay. Hello. Okay, all the best. Wish you all the okay, best. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Miss Navami, for your thank talk. You, May I request now next speaker, Mrs. Rasha Rahman PK, to start her talk, please. Her OP code is OP06. We also request you to please limit your talk to seven minutes and rest three minutes can be taken for discussion. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes. My screen is visible? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rasha Rahman. I'm here to present my research work entitled An All Integrated Flexible Electrochemical Sensor for the Real Time Detection of Dopamine Released by Human Neural Cells. We know neurotransmitters are molecules which control the transmission of signals within the neural system. And any hindrance in the secretion or uptake of these molecules result in their abnormal levels, which might end up in various physiological disorders. So apart from this physiological interest, they also play a major role in the behavioral and social aspects of humans. So today we are going to speak about one of the very important neurotransmitter that is dopamine. So chemically, it is 3,4-dihydroxyphenethylamine from the catecholamine family from precursor molecule L-DOPA. And the physiological importance is that um, both increase and decrease in the level of dopamine is going to cause uh, several physiological, physiological disorders. For example, the, uh, if the uh, level of dopamine in the human body is uh, decreased, it might end up with uh, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or aging brain. And if it is uh, higher, it might end up with uh, schizophrenia. And it can also act as a biomarker for drug abuse and uh, internet addiction syndromes. 
So it is very important to maintain an optimum level of dopamine inside the human body, and it is equally important to detect the amount of uh, dopamine present inside the human body. So when we consider uh, the detection uh, techniques, uh, when compared to the conventional techniques, electrochemical uh, techniques are far advancing because of the their cost effectiveness and the user friendliness. So when we speak about the electrochemical uh, techniques, there are several materials which can be used to modify the electrodes, but many of these are highly expensive like noble metal nanoparticles or else they are prepared by uh, complex synthesis methods. So here we are using one of the very uh, important and more, uh, very commonly used binary transfer metal oxide that is nickel cobaltate, which is having an inverse spinal structure. And the highlight is that it is very cheaper and uh, it can be synthesized very easily and it is having an enhanced redox property. So here uh, we are employing a bisolvent interface assisted method for the synthesis of uh, nickel cobaltate, where we have taken butanol water interface for the, uh, for the synthesis of uh, two dimensional nanoflake like structures. So the morphology is um, confirmed using a CM and TM and an AFM analysis where we can see that we have obtained one nanometer thick flake like structures. The characterization also shows the presence of uh, nickel, cobalt, and oxygen in the system in the stoichiometry NiCO2O4. So in order to increase the conductivity of this uh, nickel, uh, nickel cobalted, we have composited it with multivolt CNT. And for this, we have uh, taken HPMC solution to which multivolt CNT is added, and uh, which gives a dispersion to which required amount of nickel cobalted is added to form nickel cobalted multivolt CNT composite. So how much amount of multivolt CNT should be added is optimized using uh, conductivity studies using a four probe instrument where we can see that by the initial addition of uh, multiple CNT, there is no uh, greater difference in the conductivity. And here the overall conductivity is used due to the non-omic interaction between this filler and the matrix. And once a percolation threshold is crossed, we can see that this interaction becomes omic and there is a drastic increase in the conductivity. So in order to get the in, uh, exact amount, we have taken the first derivative of conductivity and 3.37 weight percentage of multiple CNT is optimized to be composited. So the SEM and TM analysis shows that uh, it forms the composite forms a network-like structure where this multiple CNT is acting as channels between two flake-like um, nickel cobaltates. The Raman spectra also shows that there is very good interaction between NC and multiple CNT. So coming to the electrochemical studies from the EIS, uh, we can see that the resistance is getting reduced from kilo ohms to ohms when we come from nickel cobaltate to multiple CNT composite, which is due to the increased conductivity of the composite. And here, this redox peak is in presence of 100 micromolar dopamine solution. We get a very good redox peak for this composite. And this first one is for bare GCE, second one is for nickel cobaltate alone, and third one is for the composite modified GCE. And we can see that uh, when we incorporate 3.37 percentage of CNT, there is an increase in the redox current for uh, 950 percentage increase in the redox current when compared to nickel cobaltate modified. Um, GCE. So this particular redox peak is correspond to the redox reaction of dopamine into dopamine or the quinone and uh, vice versa. And we have uh, tested the linear range and we could see that uh, the material is having a very good linear range from one to 200 micromolar concentration of dopamine with an LOD of 60 nanomolar. And the interference studies have been taken uh, where uh, dopamine is mixed with uh, 10 times higher concentration of the interfering species. And we could see no considerable change in the NODP currents uh, when this uh, interfering species have been incorporated. So the sensitivity and selectivity of the sensor is proved. So since this is having a very good sensitivity and selectivity, we have tried the real-time detection of this dopamine in presence of uh, neural cells. Here we have subcultured our human neuronal cells, that is SHSY5I neural cells in ADMEM medium and to which uh, L-DOPA, the precursor of dopamine is added. So after two hours, we are adding KCL, which can trigger these neural cells to release dopamine. So that released dopamine is detected by our material. So we can see in the result that by a successive addition of this KCL, we can see spike-like signals, which show that uh, the material is um, capable of detecting dopamine released by these neural cells. So that is a real-time detection. We have also studied uh, the detection of dopamine in um, artificial sweat with an LOD of 65 nanomolar and um, at, uh, human serum with an LOD of 68 nanomolar. The stability, reproducibility, and lifetime of the sensors have been studied, and the sensor is found to be stable and reproducible. 
And as proof of, of proof of concept, we have uh, tried the preparation fabrication of a flexible sensor. This is the prepared sensor where NC multivolt CNT is acting as a working electrode. Conductive silver paste is the pseudo reference electrode and pyrolytic daffage sheet is, is the counter electrode. The electrical connections are made using copper tape. And this is how the detection is made using this uh, integrated sensor. And we can see that um, it is giving signal for uh, dopamine starting from one nanomolar concentration. By successive addition of concentration, we are getting an increased uh, um, signal. And uh, detection of dopamine released by neural cells have also been tested using this particular uh, sensor where we can see that on successive uh, addition of KCL, we have uh, increased current. So as a conclusion, we have prepared two-dimensional nano nickel cobaltate for detection of dopamine. Multi-wall CNT has been uh, incorporated. Uh, the composition has been uh, done and the, uh, it has been used for the detection of dopamine. The real-time monitoring of dopamine has been done using neuronal cells and the flexible all integrated sensor have been fabricated. These are my references and thank you. In the, in the multi-wall uh, CNT, Yes, sir. Uh, what what is what is responsible for the sensing? Uh, so multi volt CNT is uh, highly um, conducting. So this multi volt yeah. CNT is uh, acting as a channel for the smooth uh, transport of electrons. So uh, if this uh, multi volt CNT is acting as a channel, means this electrons will be uh, when the uh, dopamine to dopamine orthoquinone that uh, conversion is taking place, this electrons will be tra uh, transported faster. Yeah. So that so uh, the uh, you have made actually a composite of multi wall CNT yes, in, yes. Uh, in uh, so do they have the same functions when you make a composite or is the reduced function of multi wall uh, CNTs when you make it in a composite? Our, uh, our original 100 percent multi wall CNT is not giving this much uh, uh, sensing. Because here the uh, uh, substrate is always nickel cobaltate. The multiple CNT is only enhancing the uh, sensing mechanism. So, so only in that uh, form in the multiple CNT in that uh, uh, when you make the composite only it's working. Yeah, it is working. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What is the role of uh, inverse spinel structure on reduction of dopamine? Inverse spinel structure, uh, I think, is not having any particular role. Only the morphology is having a greater role. That two-dimensional morphology means uh, the surface area will be enhanced. And what, is the, what is the mechanism of reduction of dopamine to NH3 plus? From mm -hmm. where the electrons are coming? Uh, it is actually nickel, nickel and cobalt. Uh, um, uh, is getting nickel and cobalt and NiCO2O4 is getting oxidized to NiOOH and COOOH. And when they reduce back to NiCO2O4, uh, this uh, uh, dopamine is getting oxidized to dopamine orthoquinone. That is a cycle-like structure, cycle-like. Uh, then why can't you take a normal spinel? Normal spinel would be uh, okay, sir. Hmm? Normal spinel would also give uh, sensing. Just, uh, just please depending. check the importance yeah. of variable valency in an inverse spinel structure to the facilitation of redox reaction. Okay. 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 Is any part of this work done abroad or at NIT Calicut? Uh, no, sir. We are doing it uh, in NIT Calicut itself. Okay. Good luck. All the best. Thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone. And the session is uh, over. Now we can close this oral session and. Uh, we will end the session and uh, shortly we will start the uh, post session. Already we are delayed by uh, 20 minutes. So immediately we can start the post session. You just give five minutes to us, okay? Yes, yes, sir. No issues. Sir, is it Dr. Karthik? Sit through. Dr. Karthik? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mean to say that uh, we have to close and uh, rejoin? Yes, yes, because post is a separate session. Yes, sir.